So my name's Alex Wharton and I'm a writer and poet. I write for both adults and children. I'm inspired by the natural world. I'm inspired by all of these kind of natural elements, whether it's wildlife, forestry and landscapes. Um, and it's definitely nature brings an undertone to most of the things that I write. The poem that I've chosen is called King Fisher and it comes from my uh, recently published book of poems, Daydreams and Jelly Beans. And I think that it's a sensitive approach to the nature around us, the feelings, the sounds, and those kind of things, really. So I feel like Kingfisher, the poem, expresses those things, those feelings and that attentiveness. I saw you zipping through threads of shallow summer air, blue into green. Where do you rest? Where is your fishbone nest? I saw you again in your sunbeam vest, orange into blue. Your laser tight flight splits time in two. I saw your whistle holding on to your wings. When you arrow into water, the ripples sing and branches stretch the river for one tickle of your flame, for a sprinkle of stardust. You're worth the risk, they say. Wow, wasn't that beautiful? Hi everybody and welcome to the British Council Literature Seminar 2021. We are Wales, disparate voices, landscapes and stories is our topic. I'm Elke Ritt, Head of Arts of the British Council in Germany and I've been working on the seminar with colleagues from Wales, London and Germany. I'm delighted that we have such a wonderful lineup of writers from Wales such excellent seminar chairs and a crowd of 400 online. 
But of course, we would have so much preferred to have you all welcome at the beautiful Literaturhaus in Stuttgart as originally planned for tonight. So let's start with some housekeeping guidelines as always. Some of our authors will speak in Welsh throughout the seminar. If you do not speak Welsh, there will be simultaneous translation from Welsh to English throughout the event. All you need to do is click on the interpretation icon, which looks like a globe, and you can then select English to hear the translated audio, as well as having the option to mute the original audio instead of hearing it in a lower volume. There will also be a link in the chat for live captioning. Please click on this and a tab will open where you will be able to adjust the text and background. You can then have it open and situated on the screen in a space of your own choice, where you can view the speakers and live captioning throughout the event. We will be using the chat box to make announcements and we encourage you to write in your comments and questions via the chat box too. When asking questions, please type in question in capital letters and then write in your question. Please make sure you have selected all panelists and attendees. Someone in the team will be moderating questions and comments as they come in. You can of course also raise your hand to ask a question and the moderator will come to you. You will then not be seen, but we will hear your voice. We will be doing live tweets do, uh, throughout the seminar event. And the hashtags we are using are hashtag Wales Lit Germany and Wales in Germany. Please join in and post your tweets using the hashtags. And now I would like to hand over to my wonderful colleague, Rebecca Gold, the British Council's Head of Arts in Wales. Thank you for all the good and hard work. And over to you, Rebecca. Diolch, Elke. Hello, Noswaitha. Croeso i seminar Llenedi Aeth British Council. Rebecca Vernui o British Council Cymru. Hello, welcome to the British Council Literature Seminar. I'm Rebecca Gould, Head of Arts at the British Council in Wales. Um, and just to add to what Elke has already said, over the next three days, we will be hearing from many writers in both the Welsh languages, English and Cymraeg. As Elke has already mentioned, if you don't speak Welsh, don't worry. Some of our writers will read and answer questions in Welsh. And our simultaneous translator, Gwynvor, is here to translate for you from Welsh to English. We hope that you may want to buy some of the books that you hear about over the next couple of days. And we really want to encourage you to buy books from individual Welsh bookshops or from the Welsh publishers. So we will be sharing links to local bookshops and Welsh publishing houses in the chat. As part of the seminar, you will have seen, we have commissioned six brilliant writers to make six short films all across Wales. We've just seen the first film by Alex Wharton reading his poem, The Kingfisher. This was shot in woods near Pontypool in South Wales. We hope that these will enable you to get to know Wales better, to get to know our disparate voices, our landscapes and our stories. We will also be showing a series of short films called Plethy Weave. Plethy Weave is a lockdown project across our digital collaboration between Literature Wales, our seminar partner, and the National Dance Company of Wales. The project weaves poetry and dance to create a unique snapshot of Wales and the world right now. We'll be hearing more from the Plethy Weave team, uh, Shleiki Schenkin and Paul Kane, CEOs of Literature Wales and the National Dance Company Wales, who will be joined by artists to make up two panels tomorrow, one in Welsh and one in Cymraeg. All these films will be premiered on YouTube and the links will be posted in the chat in case you want to watch them again or if you want to share them with anyone else. Finally, on Friday evening, we want to invite you to our own lockdown literature seminar party. An evening of short films, music and filmed artworks by some of Wales's leading artists. 
This is all being curated and presented by Gary Raymond, novelist, editor of Wales Arts Review and presenter of the BBC Wales uh, Review Show. It will start at eight o'clock and it, there will be an informal evening. Um, however, to get the very best out of the music, we do recommend that you watch or listen with headphones. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce my brilliant colleague, Harriet Williams from the British Council Literature Team in London. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome. Um, if during the course of the seminar you want to know more about the writers, uh, please visit our seminar blog, the link to which is going to be posted in the chat. Uh, when you click on the link, uh, click the blog tab to read more about the writers that are part of the seminar. We have a separate blog for each of the writers and a blog containing information on other literature from Wales, so please do check it out. Um, and now I'm delighted to introduce Robert Humphreys, CBE and Fellow of the Learned Society of Wales and a Trustee of the British Council. Thank you very much. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the British Council Literature Seminar, We Are Wales, organised jointly by the British Council's teams in Wales, London and Berlin. The Literature Seminar was founded in 1986 by Sir Malcolm Bradbury, the father of creative writing teaching in the United Kingdom. This year is the seminar's 36th edition. Due to the pandemic, of course, we're holding it for the first time in an online form. Also for the first time, the seminar will be entirely dedicated to writers in Welsh and English who are based in Wales. It will feature readings, discussions, workshops with the writers, and films. If you're not from Wales and you know just one thing about our nation, it may be that we have our own language, one of the oldest in Europe. Cymraeg, Welsh, exists today, of course, in a vibrant multicultural Wales. Our writers make language sing, whether that's actual singing or Welsh writers' magical way with poetry and prose. And that's whether the language they're using is Welsh or English. That special literary quality is certainly on show in the outstanding lineup of writers at this year's event, selected by the seminar chairs, Neil Griffiths and Francesca Vrader. Zoe Brigley, Richard Gwynn, Manon Stephen Ross and Charlotte Williams will appear on stage. Six further exciting writers, Elina Gramich, Hannah Nisa, Ivan Morgan Jones, Jao Morais, Richard Owen Roberts and Alex Wharton, who we've already seen, will contribute virtually to the seminar. The seminar has been made possible thanks to the very generous financial support from the Welsh Government and to the hard work of Ivona Dealey and of Samantha Diamond of the Welsh Government's hub in Berlin. I'd also like to give a special mention to Elena Schmitz and her colleague Miriam Williams from Literature Wales, who've been fantastic ambassadors for the seminar and for Welsh literature generally within the British Council. The seminar is not the only opportunity for German audiences to connect with Wales. David Ellis Thomas, the Deputy Minister for Culture, Sport and Tourism in the Welsh Government, will speak to you in a moment about this year's Wales in Germany season, a rich series of encounters between Germany and Wales on the non-competitive playing field of culture. Now, the original plan was for this year's literature seminar to take place at the beautiful Literature House Stuttgart. We're sorry that the lockdown and other restrictions in Germany and the UK make this impossible. We know that the writers from Wales and faithful followers of, liter of the Literature Seminar in Germany have been looking forward to the face-to-face -face event, meeting old friends and making new ones. However, we also know, don't we, that literature happens in the mind. No pandemic or travel restriction can prevent the transmission of literature from one open mind to another. Now, on another night, I'd now be introducing Dr. Stephanie Stegman, director of the Literature House, who would give us a, a virtual flavor of her wonderful venue in Stuttgart. We have some technical difficulties. I very much hope you get to see that virtual tour sometime during the next couple of days. It's now my huge pleasure and privilege to introduce David Ellis Thomas, Deputy Minister for Culture and Tourism in the Welsh Government. 
We're very fortunate in Wales to have as a deputy minister with responsibility for culture, someone who has a background, a professional background in adult education and who himself is a scholar of Welsh literature. And also someone who has always presented intellectual and cultural challenge to the way things are and the way things might be, fully in line with a cultural approach to life and the world. He's been a long-standing supporter and advocate for literature and wider cultural production. So with, my, uh, with this introduction, please let, let's hear from our Deputy Minister, David Ellis Thomas. Diolch fawr, danke, thank you. Diolch yn fawr, Rob, uh, am y cyfluniad caredig, fe fyddai yn siarad yn gyntaf yn Gymraeg, ac yna yn dweud gair yn Saesneg. Yn anffodus, diw fe Almaeneg llafar i ddim ddigon da i fi uh, wneud hynny mewn Almaeneg. Mae'r digwyddiad yma, a digwyddiad chithiol arbennig hwn, yn adlew o'r chi y cyfnod yn dani yno fo ar draws Ewrop ac ar draws y byd. Mae hi wedi bod yn gyfnod anodd iawn i bawb ohono ni. Ond i mi y mae llenyddiaeth a chelfyddyd o bob math yn gyfle i ni ymateb yn greadigol i'r cyfnod anodd y dynnu'n byw yn ddafod. Mae creadigrwydd yn golygu yn bod ni'n gallu edrych i'wch law y sefyllfa anodd yr ydyn ni yn ddi hi. Ac ydyn ni'n gallu drwy ddychmygu dyfodol amgen yn gallu gweld beth sy'n bosib hyd yn oed ynghanol tywyllwch yn awsterau fel hyn. It has been my privilege to be the Culture Minister represented with responsibility for culture, tourism and sport in Welsh Government for over three years. I never thought that uh, at uh, the end of my responsibilities we would be faced by such a crisis. But we have responded positively as human beings everywhere in community to the great tragic event of the pandemic. And culture and sport, both my main interests, have a particular role to play in raising our spirits above the crisis in which we find ourselves. And I believe this event today marks that attempt to see through the darkness and to see the possibilities of another kind of future. I am therefore very delighted to bring you formal greetings from the Welsh Government, the Autonomous Government, the Government of the, of, of the land, land of Wales, which will be the German uh, regional equivalent, or the nation of Wales, if, if you prefer, but a nation which has grown beyond emotional nationalism to understand the importance of having a proper constitution and a devolved government with culture at its heart. Thank you for listening. Diolchen Vaur, Deputy Minister, thank you very, very much. So, good abend, good evening. Um, here we are, ready to start. You're on mute, Rebecca. I'll just do that again. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Um, <coughs> bend, everybody. Um, we are about to start uh, our literature seminar proper, our literature seminar entitled We Are Wales, Disparate Voices, Landscapes and Stories. As we just heard in the introduction, the seminar is delivered by the British Council, but in partnership with Welsh Government, and we are incredibly grateful to them for their par partnership as well as in partnership with the Literature Tour House in Stuttgart. It was wonderful to watch the first of our commissioned films, and we're looking forward to meeting Alex over the next couple of days 
and the other writers across a couple of different panel discussions. Um, so the session now will be will last about an hour with a half hour reading followed by a question and answer session. Um, you can ask questions. In fact, we really, really want you to ask as many questions as you possibly can. And you can do this by typing them into the chat. Our moderator, Elena, who is here with us, will read them out. If you'd rather, you can also raise your hand using your raise your hand button at the bottom of your screens and you can ask a question directly. And as Elka said earlier, we won't be able to see you, but we will hear your lovely voices. But now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to award winning author and all round brilliant human and writer, Neil Griffiths. Neil is the seminar co-chair alongside Francesca Ruddock, who we will meet later on this evening. Neil was born in Liverpool in 1966 and he studied English. He now lives, works and often writes about Aberystwyth, a town situated on the west coast of Wales in the county of Ceredigion. His novels include Grits, which was his debut in 2000, a ferocious story narrated through a series of vernacular voices, and next came Sheepshagger, which switched between those same voices and the lyrical word drunk prose to tell a story of Yanto, an inscrutable autistic man patronized by his contemporaries. Yanto hardly speaks and is disenfranchised after childhood. To quote his friends in the novel, it would have, sorry, would have his childhood would have turned motherfucking Teresa into a murderer, Mun. Yanto sees his ancestral home brought up brought up by English yuppies. His bitter disappointment leads to a final act of violence. Next came Kelly and Victor in 2002, Stump in 2003, Wreckage in 2005, Runt in 2007, £10 Pom in 2009, A Great Big Shining Star in 2013 and his latest novel, Broken Ghosts, in 2019. He, Niall will be reading from uh, Broken Ghosts later on uh, this evening. And it's important to say that Broken Ghosts also won the Welsh Book of the Year in 2020. Neil's also written travel pieces, restaurant and book reviews and several radio plays. He's also had a poetry collection out with Wrecking Ball Press called Red Raw, in 2015. Neil Croeso, a very warm welcome. Good hour. And you're going to read three extracts for us tonight, I hope. Um, the first two from uh, Broken Ghost and one we'll say more about later. So over to you. Yeah, I'll read a couple of sections from, from Broken Ghost um, to give you an idea of the different registers of voice I use. To give you some background to, 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 to this book, um, behind where I'm speaking to you, um, this is my this is my, my study in my house. Behind, I'm at the foothills of a mountain called the Pendam Mountain. It's it's not one of the biggest in Wales. Um, it forms the foothills again of Pimlimmon, um, which again is not is is, is I think it's the seventeenth highest mountain in Wales. Um, but on old maps, um, it forms a huge mass in the centre of the country. I think because that was it loomed large in the English imagination. It wasn't long after the Glyndwr Rebellion. Um, but I'm not here to give you a Welsh history lesson, um, although hopefully you'll pick up a lot of that this weekend. So on the, on the mountaintop, there's some lakes. Um, and sometimes in, in the summer, you have raid parties at these lakes. Um, and so there's three characters, three main characters, and they've been to one of these parties and they've taken a pill, which they've been told is ecstasy. Um, it's probably not, but it's just, it's just kept them awake. While everybody else is asleep, these three are climbing a hill and they see a vision um, in the sky, um, which they later found out it could be a Brocken spectre, which some of you might know. I think the name Brocken is, was the guy who coined that was a German guy actually. So broken ghost, Brocken, broken spe spectre, ghost. Um, obviously much more than that, the title's um, much more loaded than that. Um, and this vision gives the, gives the three of them um, some kind of, how can I describe this? If I could describe this, if I could sum this up, I wouldn't have bothered writing the book, you know. Um, it gives them some kind of recognition, some 
uh, some spiritual legitimacy to their lives. So gradually, this uh, the female um, one of the, of the trio blogs blogs about this, and it because it takes it becomes viral, takes on a life online, and it gradually becomes a place of pilgrimage, of physical pilgrimage, up up at the top of the mountain. So this is the opening of, of the novel um, when the three characters. I'll just read two of the characters, when the, the characters see, have seen the vision rather, we, the reader doesn't actually see the vision. This is the female character called Emma. This is how the novel opens. It was just there. I saw it. And maybe I should say hair. I saw hair because it definitely had a woman's shape. I can always tell that shape, the curves and that. Floating in the air she was, just a bit below us. And I heard words. We'd walked up the ridge to watch the sun come up. The sun was behind us because we'd all turned to look back at the lake. They were all sleeping. Them who hadn't already gone home, I mean. There was a couple of tents, but mostly people were just crashed out on the shore on the pebbles. A few fires were still going, but had nearly gone out. Just smoke. Only a handful of people left, and only the three of us were awake. Me and that scouse lad, what do they call him? Adam? Adlad? And that nutter, that cowley, who was messing about with the iPod he dropped off one of the students. I didn't really want him there, me. He gives me the gist of the best of times he does. And I could feel the come down start to make itself known. And I just didn't want him there, but it's not like I asked him to come. He just followed us up like onto the ridge. It had been raining, drizzling lightly for a bit and hadn't long stopped. And all steam was coming up off the lake in these mad shapes like ghosts. And then there was this glow, this glow in the air, just below as it was, but not on the ground. I mean, it was in the air, like floating. And Adam was looking at me with his eyes all big, like what the fuck? And I looked and there was a woman in that glow, the shape of a woman. I'm not kidding. She was hanging there in the air and I heard words. I heard the word bridge and I heard the word dig and I heard the word wild. And it was like she was talking to me, telling me something that I needed to know. I don't know. I can't explain. And it's like everything went away. Everything. Adam and Cowley and the people sleeping on the shore of the lake. Everything I'd done in the past. It was like none of that mattered anymore. It was like there was this great big bubble around me. It was only me and what I could possibly do. My skin felt all tingly. A kind of rush went through me, it did, a million times better than the crap E I'd had, which had done nothing except keep me awake, even though it was promising to bring a crash on me. It was, what was it? I really don't know. As soon as it was over and didn't last very long, like the very instant it was gone, I knew that I wanted it back again. I don't remember looking at the other two. The floating thing, the shadow, the woman shape, which just vanished into the air. And I thought of Thomas, my son, and how much I wanted to see him and smell his skin and hold him. So I just walked off the mountain and went home. It took ages. I was knackered by the time I got home. Tom was still asleep. I paid the babysitter and got into bed with my boy, cooched up and fell asleep dead quick, no dreams. Or at least none that I can remember. So this is Adam's impression. I just felt so fucking happy. I can't explain it. And I don't even want to try, really. I just felt so happy. Like that rubbish E should have made me feel, but didn't. Pure caffeine or something, that's all it was. It just kept me awake. Probably for the best, though, considering. I went up the ridge because I was following that Emma one's arse, that's all. I was about to go home and crash, but I saw her in them leggings, dead tight in them little boots, heading up off up the ridge, so I thought I'd follow her. And that was my plan. Home, have a sleep. Everybody was asleep on the shore. I had already gone home, so I was going to borrow someone's bike and scoot off home myself. There was a row of bikes, mountain bikes all lined up on the shore, and I was going to take one and leave a note. Honest, I was, with my phone number on. Didn't fancy the walk miles back into the town. I was even toying with the idea of knocking on the door of Rosserkan down the hill, asking if they had a spare bed for a few hours, but didn't think that'd be, that'd be a wise move. And besides, my plan was to get home and go to my own bed and have a big, long thrap to help me, help me nod off. And then I saw the Emma going up the ridge, so I followed her. I'd been talking earlier, getting on well, so I just went up after her. And that cowley had followed me, God knows why. I felt him behind me, heard his heavy breathing as he climbed up the slope, and tiny little snatches of music come out of that iPad he'd lifted off some student lad I was asking about with. It annoys me that when people scroll through and play a couple of seconds of each song, it does me head in. Not to tell him that. He'd been standing on the shore in his rugby top, no coat, just standing there like Tony Soprano with a skull crop and great big dragon tattoo on his neck. And he could see him just praying for someone to say something so as he could kick off. He didn't want him around me and him farting about the iPod was doing me head right. And what can you do? 
So anyway, we get to the top of the ridge and all the steam's coming off the lake. It looked mad. It did amazing. Took the breath out of my chest. No lie. It had stopped drizzling, but the air was still kind of damp. And then there was this glow in the air a bit below us because we were on the top of the ridge by this time. But it was floating, this glow. I even thought that maybe I was asleep and I was dreaming. But then Emma looked at me with them green eyes of hers gone big. I could see the tattooed stars behind her ear and I knew I was awake. It was like a floating glow, kind of a shadow in it as well, a vague human shape. I mean, I had a bump that could have been a head and long, thin things that could have been limbs and curves, a bit like a woman. I don't know. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I went to a kind of trance. It was like a heroin hit. That's the only thing I can compare it to. I just felt so happy. Funny how it made me feel that way, because, I mean, it was just a shadow or something. The sun was coming up. The air was damp. Something in the atmosphere, that's all it was. And when I started feeling like normal again, I looked around and the other two had gone and I was all alone on the ridge on top of the mountains. So I just walked home. It took ages. Stoked me cat and went to bed and slept like a log on Mogron, didn't even dream. And this is Cowley's impression. It's a fuss about fuck all. It was just a fucking blob in the sky, rising sun or something. I wasn't even looking. I was trying to find some decent sounds on that machine that I found not robbed. Some student come to drop it in the rushes, like, don't even know how to work the fucking thing. It was all some chart shards or some arty shards I've never even heard of. No phonics or anything decent. Every boring twat had crashed or gone home. So I just went up a ridge with the others. That scouts and that girl, I think her name's Emily or something. And it was just a blob in the sky. That's all it was. The rising sun in the cloud. Fuss about fuck all I saw now. And then gradually, um, as I say, um, it becomes a place of pilgrimage. Um, this site on top of the lake. And this is when the beginnings of the pilgrimage, when just, just a few people have gathered. This section is called Meat. M E A T. The slaty waters of clean suburban give back no sun as yet, still rising as it is beyond the hump of Disquilva Bower. Soon they will. When the lifting wisps of mist have been hauled up into airy blue, then the disc will be seen hovering over the islet on which geese and moorhens nest. The dry sedge of that island and the crisp ryegrass of the banks and shores, soon a single match could sweep all of this up into one abrupt rush of flame. A breath ruffles the lake's surface, strokes out with foamy scrolls that tap at the pebble shore with the noise of a cat at a milk bowl. Used fire pits crater this shore, and a log once used as a bench moves with the rising and sinking of the sun between damp and dry, conditions of which the orange underlips of plate fungi have taken full and opportunistic advantage. Bog bean bows in the fleeting breeze, the ducking pinkness in flashing its inside white. Little bombs of bilberries nod in the grasses. Yarrow galaxies slowly help to heal the acidulated standing pools that remain after the conifers have been cropped. The regulated ranks of these trees, ordered and uniform like the politicians who compel their planting, ripped from the ridge and sides about. A rowan tree observes, and maybe the hiss of air in its ferny leaves is a comment. Sand martins have returned to their warden in the powdery bank at the lake's eastern end and are feeding now. Their sickle wings skimming the water, gulping gnat and midge, and joined by the, their cousins, the swifts and the swallows. A tribe of screech and speed, forever and deeply wild, although their travels obey utterly dictates laid in their brains when the rock up here flowed and was still halfway soft. Tonight, when the sun will be sinking beyond Krager Pistol into the sea at the valley's end, Dorbenton's bats will join them, bulleting too, white breasted too, and chasing the same prey. Bird and mammal exulting both in flight and fright when the sun burns the sky, scarlet and gold. The dog and the barrow, the bulk of cloth stones, the mines on the valley floor, Nantararian, see the silver, transhumance and tumuli, industry and burial and worship, all from five fingered hands, having part of this high land shaped and stained it for millennia, mapping the movements of the night sky, other patterns brightly high. Stone cottages crumble into mounds of mouldy boulders, tunnels capillary the hills, dug out dwellings marked by huge chunks of quartz, the simple water that flows, malleable land that endures yet as the people pass, always the people pass. Their things seen off by the hives of hornets or the tunnelings of moles, or even the thin marks that migrating birds make through the clouds, the oldest narratives made by them. When these volcanoes were active and the sky was red threaded black and worms writhed away from bigger worms and left ribbony traces in the rock that was then mud. Such stories up here and such echoes. And with what do we decode and assess? All there is is flesh in this. Infinity in the joints of the legs of a millipede in the pulverized pearls on the wings of a moth. All the pallid empires of men. 
In the husky mutes of the owls are tiny bones of paper, skulls breakable by breath. The merlin leaves small pancakes of shit on the blocks where he has butchered little birds, and they resemble the paths of lichen, yet in that lichen lies a world which also eats and ejects. Five fingers form some humps, and tilted mighty stones erect, and tame the trees into uniform files with the flicking and creeping and crawling that steadily makes them nothing but matter, find voice in the call of the vanishing corncrake and cuckoo, and its only words are, fuck you, fuck you. And still the people return. Visions shimmer in the crackling air. Several of them this early morning on the shores of the lake, one wearing a clerical collar. Each isolated from the other, as yet, but they will talk and share soon. Outflies out from the hive online, meet a mysteries from the virtual world. One of them studies an OS map of this area, the lake and its surrounds, and points to a ridge. And another follows his finger and speaks. And these first words, although spoken low, do bounce back from the water and the encompassing hills. Do you think that's where she, that's where she was seen? The figure of the map nods. Someone has lit a candle and balanced it on a rock. Some other is on his knees at the water's edge and has genuflected and now appears to be praying. The two who have spoken now wordlessly begin to ascend the ridge and the man, man in the collar starts up after them. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Um, what an incredible start to a novel and... I kind of relived it all again. I read it for the first time when it came out um, just before, and actually just before it won the, the award. And uh, and I had that same sort of visceral feeling um, in my tummy that I had when I read it for the first time. Thank you. Um, you're, Neil, you're a writer of huge antithesis. I mean, there are two very, very distinct contrasting styles often butting right up against one another, it feels. Um, one sort of more conversational and, and demotic and, and one you might say writerly or, or poetic. Um, what does this say about the way in which you see the world and, and how you want to depict it? Well, um, I, was, I was brought up in a house with, uh, without books, really. Um, well, there were a few things, you know, there's like the, um, the Rothmans football year book and the I Spy book of the garden which told you everything you wanted to know about the wasp, except why, you know, it was always the why I wanted to know. Um, and the kind of writer, writerly part of my brain was ignited when I picked up a Ron Berry book. Ron Berry is a well, Welsh writer, un unjustly neglected. But what there was, there was always stories, you see. Um, there were stories about the war and about the old countries and ghost stories and all this kind of stuff, you know. Um, and so I just, so narrative and storytelling um, got right down deep inside. I mean, it's part of the kind of Celtic oral tradition, I suppose. But what really struck me um, was when I, I, I started to read the classics and it, it, it got me that um, there was this notion that um, literary, literary language could only be told in one way. It was, it was the, the, the BBC English that, 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 that we saw. That didn't speak to me. That had nothing to say to me. And yet when I discovered Ron Berry, he did. But... I always, I always thought from a very early age, really, I, I thought the people around me, the way they speak, it also does have metaphor and, co and consonants and, 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 and assonance and imagery and everything else, you know, and also has rhythm. It is in its own way a literary language. Um, but you weren't quite allowed to say that. You weren't allowed to even think that in many ways. You know, people from the, from the class I was from, we didn't speak in a, in a, in a literary way. It was only when I got older that I found out there were the worst. There, there was some dialect writing out there, you know, and actually some of it, some of it fa fairly old as well. So, what I always wanted to do in, in in my books was to show that the two registers, if you like, um, they're not that different to each other, really. They just they share the same values of literary language, but just from a different impulse and a different strata. So I was I was really keen. To show that and i find that that still goes on now you know i mean look what we have now as long as you speak in a posh accent you can say the worst lies and get away with it you know and mm -hmm. um, this is still endemic in british culture it seems to me but that's the one thing that drives that drives my books and um, and in doing so in, in combining in command those two registers i hope it's a it's a an attack on this notion of a c pronunciation and that literary language has to be told in one way I hope I'm, I'm. I hope I'm exposing the idiocies of that way of thinking. I absolutely think you are. Um, no, brilliant. And you, you've mentioned you brought it up the the old country, and so um, 
as this is a, a seminar about Wales, let's just uh, talk about Wales first, if that's all right. Um, so you grew up in, in Toxteth in South Liverpool, and um, presumably maybe in a street with a Welsh name and certainly with a, a view of the Cloydian Hills. Hmm. Um, would you describe yourself as Liverpool Welsh? And um, what was the old country for you? And how did that inform your identity and your writing identity? And um, Yeah, the, the, the Welsh streets in Toxteth are an interesting, um, really interesting place, you know. For those of you who don't know, um, there's streets in the middle of Liverpool that were built by Welsh builders, so they all they all are. They're quite beautiful houses, actually. Um, close knit, tightly packed terraces, um, but they go back quite a way. They're really quite beautiful houses. Um, it was when, you know, poor people were given space and a small yard and things and little patch of soil in which to grow a few vegetables and stuff like that, you know. Um, there has been sort of knocking them down, but um, that looks to that looks to have been have been prevented. So yeah, there was that, and um, we had we had family in Wales. And my granny was a was a Welsh speaker, although she'd let it go rusty. Um, there was also Irish heritage as well. Um, so I never felt, I, even though I was aware of Liverpool was in England, I, I in England was somewhere down below Birmingham. You know, it didn't it didn't really impinge on my, on my consciousness in, in, in any way. Liverpool still feels like a little island in itself. And th so that Celtic connection was always there and I felt it very, very strongly. And um, even the way I looked, you know, um, when I went to Cambridge to study the art college in Cambridge and actually saw a lot of, you know, Anglo-Saxon English people, um, I just felt so out of place. They were all tall and rangy and quiet. <laughs> I, was sh I was short and stocky and dark with blue eyes and given to gesticulating with my hands and and the and the people around me when you know that I was brought up with were, were quite they wore their emotions on their sleeves and they were given to singing in pubs and things you know and this kind of abandoned celebration and this love of storytelling you know um it was only when I kind of went it's it's only when I'm in certain parts of Ireland and and I'm, I'm, I'm Wales and Liverpool that I kind of feel at home really and um, amongst people who are around me you know mm -hmm. Um, so that always influenced me, this, this notion. I remember reading about an Egyptian scholar, um, and he was in the Liverpool Museum. There's quite a lot of Egyptian artefacts, plundered, of course, as most things are in British museums. Um, and he said he was fascinated by the, by, by the culture of, of ancient Egypt. And he had a real awakening and thought, well, my God, two, an hour away on the train, and I'm in a country that has a, a culture just as old, you know, the Pentra Ivan. Dolmen is probably older, old, older than the pyramids. The, the prehistoric um, tombs and angles here are probably older than the pyramids, and a place with its own language. And he said, it's, you know, it's on the it's on, on the doorstep of, of of England. So he began to. Now he's a I've forgotten his name. Forgive me. He's a he's a he's a renowned Welsh scholar now. So I always had that notion, and it was just when I fly now and I come back, and you know, usually if I fly from London or Birmingham, especially if I fly from London, and I travel across England in the train, I'm aware. Well, I'm not aware. I'm only aware when I cross over the border into Wales and the ground starts to rise, I feel something lift off my shoulders, you know. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm home again, even though I've just loved the, I've just, I've, I've loved the travelling, I'd love to be in Stuttgart now. So, yeah, it was always very, very deep. Um, it was in my physical, it was in my phys physiognomy, as well as in the stories and the old language. And it was, it was just all, and Horace Thomas tells a story um, in one of his essays about when he was a little boy um, and his father, was just going for a walk with him on West Kirby Beach on the Whittle, which is where, which is where I lived after I came back from Australia. But that's a longer story anyway. Um, and his father said to him, "That's your land. You can see North Wales over the Dee estuary." And he said, "That's your country." And Oris Thomas said he realised it was a foreign country. It was this place over the waves with mist, kind of the mountain peaks and all this kind of stuff. And he, and that was his country. He felt it was a, unattached to England, even though of course it is. And that's often how I uh, how how I felt and how I still feel, and um, it in, it affected the writing very very much. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's really interesting to hear you talk about Liverpool because I feel, in many ways, you're describing. I I was born and brought up in Cardiff with Irish grandparents, and I've always felt that you know Cardiff and Liverpool, particularly, were were sister cities. You know, with mm. Mm. Um, not least because they're both docks. So I mean, I yeah, I completely understand that. Um, yeah, it's kind of a there's kind of a triangle between Liverpool, Cardiff, and Dublin, really. Yeah. Those those three cities just kind of feel like the same city, but just but just with a big river between them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and just to go back to something you were saying earlier about being a, a, a dialect writer, 
I mean, I think that's fascinating, the way in which you describe the metaphors and the rhythm um, and, and the kind of, yeah, the makeup of the language, um, because, you know, that's the thing that really hits you when you read your books, isn't it? It's the thing that kind of gets into your bones and you feel the rhythm of the, of the book as much as, as you do the story, but, but the story is told in amazing word pictures so that you get the detail as well. But running alongside all of that, I often feel there's a kind of almost a classical kind of Shakespearean, if you like, idea of fate and, and much, much bigger forces that are, are at play. And they, they kind of stand behind your, the actions of your characters often. And, mm. um, and, and can you talk a little bit about the mythical and the classical in your work? And for example, when we spoke bef before today, you mentioned the idea of the, the chorus of men in Sheep Shagger, which I was saying was very Greek in its in its makeup. What what what's that? You know, where's that come from? That kind of those classical references. Is is that conscious? Is it something that just happens when you write or yeah, it's conscious. Um like with um certainly Shakespeare and other uh, Elizabethan tragedians, the the they wrote about kings because the idea of the, of a great great person falling was was the was the epitome of of, of tragedy, um, but I wanted to show that you know the smallest and um, the smallest life is an epic life and it's um, it's wrapped up with these vast forces. Um, this is, to give an example, not from me, it was um, Mary Webb, um, a Borders novelist, Welsh English Borders in, from Shropshire, and she writes um, fantastic scene with little cottage in the hills. And there's a man and a woman arguing and the camera eye pulls back and it describes the the rolling clouds as if they're folded arms on the hill and the gods are looking down on this little cottage with their arms resting on the hill which are the clouds you know i love that it just gives this this cosmic quality to these to these little lives you know to what's mm -hmm. supposedly little lives which are often the political aspect of that is to it, it, it is to show the obscenity of um of 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 neglecting such lives you know um, it makes it enlivens humanity to me. It 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 re it reanimates the importance and the vitality of the human. And like what Rob was saying before about the rhythm of language, um, in some ways it is trans it is transposition. It's transposition from from, from the Welsh. How on earth will be spoken? I like to say, you know, um, uh, you know, the my my socher on we. You translate it literally is there is there is a thirst on me. Um, I love that way of forming the words in that way and it has it says a lot where the where the where the pronoun is sidelined it's not actually you know it's not i am thirsty it's it, it's there is a thirst on me it's like you're receiving the world rather than insisting yourself on the world and i find that really fascinating about language e even though i'm ter terrible at learning them <laughs> um so I, i'd like to bring that in i like to bring the whole notion in of the way people are reacting with the world the way the world, the world reacts on people i tried to do it in a more in a, in a more palpable way in wreckage um when i you know gave voice to inanimate objects you know um i didn't think it worked and it's an experiment that i'll never try again probably the least favorite of my books that one okay. but i like to insist on people's existence you know and the importance of their existence mm -hmm. even though they might be little people that other people would step over on the way to the opera you know and they have I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? But it is exactly that. You you don't just see your sort of protagonist or your kind of, you know, you see all of the people in your novels and you get to know them all and and you don't get to know any of them through you telling us what they're like. You know, there's no description of, of character at all. Yeah. And it's all told through the way in which they speak and the rhythms of their language. Um, yeah. And I think that's incredible. I mean, that is very Shakespearean, actually, isn't it? You know, the, the kind of... The characterization is told as much by the way in which somebody speaks and the way in which they use words as by the way in which they you know and by their actions of course absolutely yeah sometimes you'll get a hint of how someone looks through the eyes of the, of another character it might be just a mention of the color of their hair or something like that yeah know, or their eyes or, or or something but i but i like the reader to well i like the reader to have the his or her own subjective idea of, of what these characters look like um I know it's particularly that important. I don't think for a writer, for, as a thing for a writer to do. You know, when I teach creative writing, and um, it opens with the main character looking in the mirror, and you think, "Oh, come on, don't do that." 
you know, think, come on, grant the reader with, with a bit more intelligence and emotional investment uh, th than that, you know? I don't think it needs to be done. I think it's a waste of time, really. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and the way people speak does is, is suggestive of how they look somehow. I don't, know, I don't know how that magic works, but writing is magic, isn't it? But yeah, and also, of course, what it does is it allows you, the reader, to to meet you and to create those characters, or certainly yeah. what they look like, with you, which which means that they're much more prominent and much more important. To yeah, the I think I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, r r you know, r reading reading and writing is collaborative. It's the re the re the writer and the reader working working mm -hmm. together. It's it's uh, you know, reading a great book is having a great conversation with someone really interesting. It seems to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you said something that somewhere, or maybe it was you or somebody said, a great book reads you. And I like, reads you, yeah. 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 I think I think that might have been that might have been Tolstoy who said that. Oh originally. really? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I, I could be wrong. But it's a great quote. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Um, and I'm I'm aware that you know we've only got so long, but luckily we're with you for the whole weekend. So um hopefully we'll we'll hear a lot more from you. And we do want to hear from from our audience. So um, if it's all right with you, um, could you read us another section um, or another piece of a new novel, I think, this time? Yeah. And, and you can tell us a little bit about it as well, if that's all right. Yeah, this this is yet to be published. Um, it's called Between Talons and Teeth. It's out with my agent at the moment and my editor. My editor, about for 20 years, retired. Um, uh, so we've got a new editor. Um, and this is, it's, it's, I never thought I'd do it. It's an historical novel. I never thought, I never thought I'd write this. I quite like reading some historical novels, but... It seems to be a bit of a vogue now for literary writers to write historical novels. I, I think, I don't know, I have, I have suspicions about this. I think it's because people don't know how to deal with the modern world. They don't need to do, they don't know what to do with the um, um, the giant brain that is the internet, you know. They, they don't have to deal with it. Or mobile phones, you know, they don't know how to bring in a mobile phone. It, 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 it disrupts the plot. You know, again, again, when I'm teaching writing and someone starts off dropping dropping the mobile phone in, in, in the river and you think, oh no, I can see where this is going, isn't it? You know, the plot would have all fallen to bits if someone had a mobile phone. So I think that's why people are, are going back, they're, they're going back to a time pre-internet technology, pre pre this, uh, this connected, globally connected technology. But um, there's a guy who used to live local, um, he doesn't anymore, Gideon Coppola, who did a wonderful film called Sleep Furiously, um, a documentary film about this area where I live in Wales. Um, if any of you can find that, it's an absolutely uh, wonderful piece of work. And he had an idea to film this about this guy called Sean Agorf, which means Sean of the Caves, who was a real character. Um, he was very young, he was about 18, um, and he lived in a place called Kumsumlog, which is a little tiny mining village um, that in, in, down the valley behind me. But the more, into, the more research I did in this, um, there's records of people from Brazil in Kumsumlog, all over Europe, African people in Kumsumlog, because they all came to work in the mines. Um, you know, they were small, they were small multicultural cities, that tiny. Anyway, Sean, um, Sean was secretly seeing um, the wife of the gardener who worked for the man who lived in the manse, you know, the mine owner. Um, he got her pregnant um, and ran away. He ran away to uh, stay little or deliver, um, which would have been a good two or three days walk at that time. Um, and he set up house there. A um, couple of years later, um, this woman called around and said, this is your baby. Um, Sean said, it's not mine. I have another wife now and all that kind of thing. And then um, sent her away. A few days after this, um, he, she was found at the bottom of a mine shaft, a disused mine shaft. Sean was arraigned. Um, and when they, when they were dragging him off, he ran into a pool um, to try and drown himself or just to escape. Um, he was still very young. He would have been around 20 at the time. Um, and as you can see that now, <laughs> Sean Agoff, it's, you, you can go and see it's still there. They took him to, they took him to like a kangaroo court um, and they found him guilty, even though he always protested his innocence. And they took him to Welshpool, um, where he was sentenced to, to be gibbeted. Um, but because he was a, because he's a metal worker in, in the mine, the judge um, told him to build his own gibbet. So Sean took quite a lot of time over this, as, as you would. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd try and take about 40 years to be honest with you um and when he but eventually they said enough now enough you know bring out what you've you know you're going to be gibbeted so sean had spent his time building this elaborate gibbet with um dragons on it and angels made you know because he's, he's created obviously to extend the time that he was before he'd be to be gibbeted but also his creativity at the last was coming out in this the more research i did the more sean's not a romantic hero he was um, 
Um, a not particularly nice guy. Um, anyway, I've romanticised him, of course. Um, and so they gibbeted him in Deliva, where he where he was supposedly where so he supposedly murdered m- murdered this woman and her baby. Um, and his and the gibbet stood for a hundred years because of the air up there it kind of mummified him. And up, up until nineteen thirty eight, there is still pictures of this. Um, in a chemist in Machuntleth, they still had the gibbet with Sean's remains in it. Sean's wizened remains in a chemist shop where you'd go to, you know, buy get tonics and physics and things to keep you alive. Um, now the remains of Sean's skull on the gibbet um, is in uh, the Museum of Welsh Life in St. Fagans. But that's the true story of Sean O'Goff. So the story captured my heart. And even though, as I said, I, I never thought I'd write an historical novel. There's something about this that, that really um, made me think. So this is the opening of this novel called Be- Novella. It's a, short, it's a short piece of work called Between Talons and Teeth. Once there was a liquidity beneath a black and boiling sky threaded with red and jagged shapes, and then there was a vast cooling and slow solidification happened, and now there's a boy, man, or a man, a boy, picking across a great flank of an eeled rock. Scarebird scrawny he is in the torn and drifting sheets of mist which rise from the cracks and crannies. So many ghosts of the swallow dead. Clad in rags, this man like a boy is, and shod in little more than ripped scrims of stuff, the white of an elbow, the gnarled nub of a begrimed toe. Tiny by the barn big boulders that the amassed grey pressure of the street has pushed into the gullies, and between them he bends and plucks and stands and drops over his shoulder into the sack on his back his findings. Fungi, flowers, other growths, even just stones that take his fancy, the occasional bone. The long-fingered hand of him with the nails like pale beetles and the wounds both old and sealed and fresh and runny red. Dirt making runes of the lines and creases in his knuckles and palms. These are the hands between the sky and earth that once both boiled and that in a million hidden fiddlings and nibbles have funneled the hills within with empty and echoing webs. These hands that scrape moss of stone with a blade and bag it. The keening of a bird above and around, big bird that throws a shadow through the mist and hercules a cruciform thought across the swoop of stone. Boyd, seren, boyd, seren. Food cast down and treats Teach from the mountain, my mountain, mother mountain, just what is often here I am. Not all I need, no, not all of it, but it is here and here I am and accept it all I will. Vast shadows flow fluid down the slope like ink spilled from the well of a titanic scribe. Twin megaliths emerge from the mist fringe billows as if an emotion will within the antique stone hearts and thin and needy the boy man stops to saw from them lichen. Yellowy scraps like the dead skin from the mending flash burn or like the diluted dribbles that circle the moon. From the deep grass at the roots of those stones poke clustered brown nipples, and he squats and plucks and eats, spits out soil and the stiff worms of hard stalk, but mostly swallows, a flop of dotted drool on his chin, which he wipes away with the back of a hand. Slime of spittle gritted with dirt and commas of dark mushroom meat, lids come down across the blue of his eyes. To suck like this, that is all, like I once did, like we all once did, oh mother mountain like the calves and the pigs that the Hibernians do keep. Not enough, no, but what is offered I will take, and here I am now, and there I want to be, and this is why. Bundles of fleece snagged on thorns and thistles like blown seas, the clocks of dandelions, out of which might grow ovines more, and many. They gather to their spindly spokes droplets and hold on to them tiny eggs and thrash in the lifting wind. The mountain takes a breath, huffs and exhales, pale race from its exits and entrances, sound from these thresholds, clanks and hammerings and the engulfed calls of men. Grasp this if you can. Wings mantled over it like the birds with their eggs and chicks, and food too in the grass, or like the suckling pigs, or like the wolves that cling singing on in places that cling to them too, like they themselves cling because they will not last forever. No, nor this, nor it all. Thank you. Ah, brilliant. Thank you. Goodness me. Um sort of terrifying and brilliant <laughs> thank you um i've all yeah the, the personification of the of the landscape there particularly you know i think when you're wandering on your own in amongst it you you often you often think the mountains breathing or mm. dipping or, um mm. and it's just yeah amazing just to be able to picture that through through your words thank you mm. um we're going to go to the audience now if that's all right um yeah sure uh I've got lots more questions, but I just want to give everybody out there, I don't know how many of you there are, but um, I, I'm, 
I'm told by my little, oh, 137 of you, that's quite a lot. Um, let's hope you've all got some questions. So Elena, who is gonna, who's gonna, who been moderating the chat for us, I don't know if she can hear me. Have yes, I, I can, Rebecca. Um, we've got uh, two questions in the chat at the moment. The first one from David Cottis. Um, question is, you write a lot about the natural world in rich, loving detail. Do you think that growing up in a big city affects the way in which you write about nature? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, one thing I always remember is um, when we lived in a, in a place called Netherley in North Liverpool, um, and we were going to go to the zoo. We were going to—I was only a kid—and we were going to go to Chester Zoo. Um, and, and then some people called around. And we couldn't go, so I was—I was in a big sulk. You know, I wanted to go and see the animals. Now I wouldn't go to the zoo. You know. Um, anyway, um, and my dad said um, to make me feel better. He said, "He said, oh, you don't need the zoo, son. Come on, I'll show you." So we went out into the into the garden and he pulled up a little bit of turf that went up against the wall and, and all these little insects came running out and daddy long legs came flying out. Um, so I remember that. Um, and so I spent, he, he was, you know, he was happy. He went off with the visitors and I just sat in the garden just looking after these insects, you know, um, and finding, you know, these, these little monsters of them. And then when I was a kid between nine and 12, we grew, grew up um, in Australia. We had 10 pound palms and we emigrated to Australia. Um, so I've, I've always been aware of, that that these what what happens around us even in cities and um even the life that lives on us you know i've been toying with an idea of writing something about that about the the lice and not that not that we're infected we have these things living on us you know we can be very very clean so i've been toying with that idea that, um but then i suppose when we used to go to wales but when i first really experienced was when i was about 17 or 18 i'd been i'd been in trouble with the law um and the magistrate said um, we'll send you off on an outward bound course, which is, you know, you go to the, 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 the wilderness and you learn to survive. Um, you know, you live in tents and boil, get water from streams and climb mountains and all that kind of thing. And it actually did work. You know, it, it really um, um, gave me gave me an out, outlet for my energies. It doesn't so sound like much of a punishment, though. So, say again? It doesn't sound like much of a punishment, though. I suppose that was the idea. Um is that, you know, we gave an outfit. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I suppose I might, looking back now, the magistrate would have been a quite a progressive thinking kind of person, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the Daily Mail hate this, you know, the tabloid press hate this kind of thing, but it did work. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I suppose I've always been aware of nature being on the doorstep, even in cities. And then I was very aware of, of, of how the, the Wales as a, raw, as a rural place is, is seen as a kind of playground um, for quite wealthy people. As a place to react and, and, and relax and, and and take and take stock, and then you get stuff like um, how green is my valley, which you know a novel which I really don't like at all, where Wales is, Wales is this, and you get it in Wordsworth too, slightly imperialist attitude in Wordsworth that, that Wales is a is a place where we all live in harmony with the natural world, you know, we all go we all go singing off to work in the mines and go home to a bowl of wham, mam's cowl and to sit by the warm fire, you know, so I wanted to show that the reality of 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 life in in rurality is so very very different you know for one thing you're never a step away from something dead you know mm. it is a place of bone and blood and shit and and and, and mess as well as beauties of course mm. but it teaches you to accept that um that these things are part of life that you know the, the the great circular motion of it so i suppose in the, in the very short answer to the question is yes and no but i suppose I, but, but i hope i've just explained why it's both yes and no mm. It's really interesting to hear you talk about about that because I, I sort of feel like we're experiencing it now in lockdown in that people are finding um, nature um, yeah. much closer to home than they're not having to to travel to places of nature. Yeah. Um, you know, and you see you see, you know, every weekend the kids in the park and, you know, looking for things and and just finding out about the natural world, not not necessarily travelling that far, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, and we have the and we have the feral goats invading Llandidno. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Love there's to see. A, yeah. There's a brilliant play um, by Thomas Eccleshare where, um, and and the theme of it was that that kind of the the world had gone wrong and and nature took over the cities and you sort of begin to you know in your novels you see 
people in nature and you see you know I just keep thinking about like the kestrel scene from um from sheep shagger you know where where they kill the kestrel and that kind of lives with you for a long time but but you know that that still feels like it's something that happens in, in the countryside whereas actually I think you know there is a time when even you know the environmental crisis that we're currently in those things are getting much closer to mm. us in the city as well yeah. Brilliant. Anyway, I'll stop blaring on because we should have more questions. So, Elena, some more questions, if you may. Yes, we've got quite a few questions that are coming in now. Um, so the next question is from Manon Stefan Ross, who, of course, is one of the writers that we hear from um, over the weekend. But um, her question is, um, so she's, she's written in the chat, um, I'm fascinated that you're writing about Johnny Gove, local scene as a body. So it's refreshing to actually imagine the complexities of his character. Do you feel the weight of responsibility when writing about a real person or are your fictional characters as real to you as Sean? Um, that's an interesting question, Manon. Um, what, if, what, if, what, an, what an interesting question. I suppose, I mean, I, I have, you know, um, the, the book about Sean Agoff. Sean Agoff will be, Perhaps unrecognisable to anyone who would, if they, if anyone was still was still old enough to recognise him, and also it's set in a in a time um, before Sean Agoff really really existed. I mean, wolves. There's still some wolves hanging on in, in the hills of Wales, and the last wolf was killed in 1729 in Wales. And when was Sean? Late 1800s. Um, so you know, I've really re I've really really played about with the um, uh, with the with the with the chronologies here. So I suppose in some ways. I'd fictionalize Sean to such an extent that even though his story, I'm, 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 true, I'm true to the actual events of his story, he has become kind of a figment of my own imagination in many ways. Um, and I feel a great weight. I feel I felt a, 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 as much of a weight with Sean to make him a fully rounded human being as I do with all my fictional characters, you know. Um, and I wanted, I mean, I did as, as much research into, into Sean O'Goff as, as I possibly could. Um, but there's not a great deal about him. Um, there's this thing, as I say, he's seen as a baddie. Well, as, rather, as Manon said, he's, he's, he's seen as a baddie. But there was a lot, I mean, there's an awful lot, lot more to him than that. It might be the case that he didn't even murder Catherine. Um, put, push her down. The, put, it was a foggy night. You know, these things weren't caught. These holes in the ground weren't, weren't cordoned off then, as they are now. So I did feel... A tremendous obligation um, to, to, to put as much flesh on the bones of him as, 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 as is possible. <coughs> but if, and I wanted to, you know, a character never really comes alive for me until they surprise me, really. And it's always in my mind thinking, like when, when I was writing Stump, um, the two characters in there, you know, I mean, Darren, the character Darren, in the, in the symbology of the novel, he's the, he's the tempter, he's the devil. But he's not, he's, a, he's not a cipher, he's a character. So I wanted him to do, you know, every now and again, make a kind gesture or something like that. You know, he's not a man who's 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 who, who's who's totally warped in, down into, into two dimensions and always shone. So again, another answer, I suppose, that ends that ends with yes or no. But again, I hope I've answered why. I hope I've explained why it's yeah. yes or no. That's Thank a fascinating you. question, though. I'll give that a lot of thought. And, and I think you've also answered that that question of are your characters real people to you because. Mm. Of course, they are for the time that you're writing them because they surprise you and and you know a, a, as much as you know real people do in a way, mm. which is mm. lovely to hear. Um, Elena, anybody got their hands up? Anybody brave enough to to speak out? This is the first session we realise. So, so uh, not so not at the moment. Nobody's got their hands up, but we've got quite a few questions um, oh. typed in at the chat. So the next one is from from uh, Florian Elvanger. Um, it's quite a long question um, around community. Um, I'm not going to read it all out, but um, one of the questions you pose is, how would you say does Brexit pressure the Welsh way of life in the context of your works and also looking back at what you've written before? Um, well, we're going to touch on that, I'm sure, um, certainly, certainly in the last panel, in, in, the, in the final panel discussion. <coughs> um, um, I mean, Broken Ghost is largely driven by rage and despair about Brexit, amongst other things, really. Um, it's not so much the, the difficult. I mean, it's, it looks like now, it looks now that Welsh ports, Fishguard, um, and Hollyhead, um, they're, they're, they're being bypassed by by uh, cargo between Ireland and, and Ireland and mainland Europe. They're not go, they're not using Britain as a as a land bridge anymore. So Welsh ports are going to die. It seems to me. Um, this whole notion of free ports, 
we had free ports up until 2012. Of course, you can have free ports in, in the EU. Um, they're not disallowed. They're, they're not prohibited. But the, but, but, the, but the Tory governments of the Cameron governments at that time got rid of them because they caused more problems than they're worth. So this nonsense that will turn it in, into free ports and this will help these struggling, struggling fishing communities is just rubbish. Absolute, absolute rubbish. Um, so there's that on the practical side. There's going to be that. Um, and it's more on the... I mean, what's, you know, that I think the United, United Kingdom is in its death throes, to be honest with you. Um, I'm hoping for Welsh independence. Um, I have been for, I have, I have been for quite a while, I, 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 and, and Scottish independence too. I think it's about time the United Kingdom kind of recognised its, mod, its um, the moribundity. But what, what is, what is, on the more cultural level, you know, th this government, is to, it, it knows it can't win on terms of the benefit, the tangible benefits of Brexit. So it turns everything into a culture war. A right-wing culture war, and it's um, what will destroy the union is English nationalism, not Welsh nationalism or Scottish nationalism. It's English nationalism that is going to that is going to, to destroy the United Kingdom. And part of me thinks about time, um, but part of me thinks there's an awful lot of people who are going to suffer from this. Anyway, I won't get into the ins and outs of Brexit. You know. I'm sure you. I'm sure you. You know what I think about it. I think it's an utter disaster that was sold on a specious salvationist prospectus to, to enrich a few idiots and satisfy the masturbatory fantasies of some imperial nostalgics. But anyway, so in direct answer to your question, it has. I think it has, even though Wales voted Brexit in fifty two forty eight, not this the part of Wales I live in, the Welsh speaking area of Wales and the capital city, um, voted quite strongly to remain. Um, and I do think it's more it's it's, it's turbocharged that sense of otherness in this part of wales i think that sense of distance and remoteness from westminster the big the biggest bit of political hope i felt in the in, in, since 2016 2015 actually since 2010 since the you know these these new tories gone gone to power was on the independence march in carnarvon in 2018 um and i just found it thrilling um it was just this sense, it, it, I, hate, I don't like the word nationalism because because of its connotations, but you know this 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 sense of self determination, this this urge for independence, and it was so sensitive. Even though there was flags being waved, songs being sung, I remember with one of my pals up in who lives up in Carnarvon, and we saw um, um, a, a family, um, a man, and a woman, two little kids, and they looked Spanish or Portuguese, looked Iberian, and I, and, my, and my pal was saying they look a bit worried, and I said they look Spanish or Portuguese. Um, and they they know what you know this kind of flag waving Latin, flag waving um, uh, parades can lead to. So later on, we had a chat with them, um, and we were explaining what Welsh independence means and all that kind of thing. You know how it was not like Salazar or Franco. Um, how it's a different thing. It's inclusive rather than rather than exclusive, and that's. And then by the end of the day, you know, we were teaching we were teaching the words the Henu Lad Vinadai, you know, and they were joining in and, and saying, saying, so we would be welcome. Of course, you'd be welcome, Wales, you know, the more the merrier, all that kind of thing, you know. So, yeah. So I think it's it's turbocharged this sense of isolation and otherness from um, the centres of power. Thank you, Neil. And um, when we spoke before this, you you talked very passionately about um, an inclusive um, Wales, um, a land forever and ever um, of incomers and uh, a land that is welcoming to, to all people. Um, and, and I took a lot from that and it was really lovely to hear it. Um, so, um, Elena, back to you. I can see some more, I can see some more long questions maybe, but. Yes, we, we have a, quite a few more. Um, just a very quick one from Elke. Um, what the title of your novella you read from the unpublished one, which I believe was Talons and Teeth. Between, between Talons and Teeth. Yeah. Between towns and teeth. Thank yeah. you. And then we have another question from Zoe Thompson, um, who wants to know, um, she says, your characters have been described as free thinking outsiders pushing psychic or sexual boundaries. Do you think your relationship with Wales and Welshness has influenced the kinds of characters you write about? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, it's all, you know, Wales has always been this, since the 60s and 70s, it's, it's, it's always been this place where um, the hit, it's a kind of a hippie ideal, really. Um, again, I do think it's a little bit patronising and condescending, you know, to come here because everybody lives in harmony, nature, connection with some spiritual force, all, all, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. 
but no, but there's a part of that that I do find quite laudable, and it, and it is this idea that this is the kind of area where those that kind of way of life and that kind of way of thinking will be welcomed, you know. Um, doing, do, um, I was do, I was going to write something about the uh, the Julie case in the seventies when all the Operation Julie, you know, when the big there was a LSD factory found in found in in, in the middle of Wales, but then somebody somebody beat me to that. But didn't. But anyway, it didn't really capture my heart. But I, I probably probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have written it anyway. And that whole thing of communal living out in out in these spaces and these 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 green areas and communing with some kind of spirituality. Yes, it has a kind of a visible side in some ways, but also I think it's quite laudable. You know, the more charitable side of me thinks it's think it's quite laudable. I mean. Um, I'm doing something for the equinox, for the spring equinox on the 20th of this month. And one of the things we're showing um, with, with a fine writer, Mike Parker, one of the things we're showing is, is a little bit of a film where a group of women um, go cadridris on, this, on, the, on the equinox and they dance all night to, to Patty Smith's horses. This sums up to Wales to me. This whole thing about going up a mountain to dance all night on the spring equinox. You think, I, I, you know, the uncharitable part of me thinks that's a little bit you know, twee. But the album they're dancing to is, is Horses by Patti Smith. If I had been Clanad or somebody, I would have thought, yeah, that's twee, that's twee. But it's Horses by Patti Smith. That kind of sums up that that that, that maverick side of, of Wales, it's, it seems to me. And then um, long may it continue. You've probably got some of those women in the audience. and uh, It might very well be. Well, if you are, <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll be seeing you on the 20th of March. Yeah, indeed. Brilliant. Um, I, I just saw a, a question uh, that I wanted to pick up on in the chat, if that's all right. So you've talked about the ideas that people have of other lands and the reason that they go and the reason that they travel. And of course, your family travelled um, from Liverpool to Australia. Um, you were you were one of the £10 poms, I believe. And I guess, and then you returned to write that book, to write uh, for Parthian £10 uh, pom. And I just wondered, what was it, you know, I know you can't answer quickly, but what was it like to return to that land of your childhood? What did, you know, tell us a little bit about that. That was fascinating. That, um, it was, there was ghosts of myself everywhere, ghosts of the, of the, of the, of the childhood me. Um, there was a, I think, about 2004, 2005, there was a film called Confessions of a Sheep Shagger, which was made about me for Channel 4. Um, and I went back to my, the place, the house where I was born in, in Liverpool. Um, and that was odd. You know, again, there's ghosts of me around, and you know, a little tiny yard where I used to kick a ball around and all that kind of thing. But going back to the other side of the world, um, and seeing things that hadn't even changed, I had I had photographs of certain areas that I took that I had from 40, 40 odd years ago, um, and they were still exactly the same, exactly the same. The how one of the houses was um, was exactly the same. The guy was outside, um, was sprinkling his lawn, so I went up and said, I "Used to live here," and showed him the picture of the house. Um, and, he, and he was, you know, are you stalking? And I was saying, no, this is this was taken many this de decades ago. It's exactly the same, same paintwork, everything. I said, oh, come in, I'll show you around. Where was your bedroom and all this kind of stuff? And we had a um, a, a big stick that was sticking out of the wall at the perpendicular and a cockatoo, a pet cockatoo. And he used to sit on this stick and squawk away. He didn't have a pet cockatoo, but he had a wooden cockatoo on the exact same stick, a model of a wooden cockatoo. So there was all this stuff going on. It was just really strange. These connections from halfway around the world were was kind of pulling me back and you know connecting me with these invisible tentacles. It was it was really odd experience, an amazing experience. Um, How easily did that transfer to to the book? I mean, did, were you able to kind of bring that out and then to to write it, or was it difficult to write about it? No, I found it quite quite easy, really. It was just, um, I, I think, you know, writing is a kind of archaeological dig inside yourself in many ways, um, and that was just that just that just that concretized that that um, that that notion. It seemed, and I like the fact that um, the the now sections are written in the past tense, and the then sections, when I was a child, are written in the present tense. I like to to play around with all that and how the boy was still in me and all that kind of thing, and how the man I've become was in that boy and all that kind of stuff you know like referring back to one of the questions before there were ant lions in australia these little tiny vicious little things and they live in cones in the sand and you get a, a small stick and very gently move the cone and this little vicious tiny thing but with jaws bigger than its body would come rushing out thinking it was an ant you see and then sometimes you'd see them drag the, they had the ants down and all this kind of stuff and i remember picking up a snake um chased a scorpion under under a, under a log and lifted the logs to look at the scorpion there's a big brown snake so 
picked up the brown snake saying, look at this, everybody. And a local farmer came running across, you know, with his hoe, you stupid little bastard. I whacked the snake out and chopped its head off. And, not, you know, I was crying, you know, I didn't want the snake to die, but it was a taipan, you know, one of the, one of the most poisonous snakes in the world. So there's all this stuff going on. Um, one thing, one thing Australia, though, what Australia doesn't have is, is any predators. After, apart from some crocodiles in the north, but there's, you might think there is, but there's nothing in Australia that wants to start, that wants to hunt and kill you. Whereas in Africa, I spent a few days in the, in, in the Namib. Um, you have cats the size of cows that look at you the way you look at a roast potato. You know, <laughs> you're just you're just tasty. That's all you are to it. Everything everything you've ever been, everything you're proud of is nothing. This cat just looks at you the way the way you look at food. That is a strange and wonderful and laudatory experience. Wouldn't have been if it had to become food for the cat. <laughs> <laughs> but I lived, to, I lived to tell the tale. But being stalked by a leopard as well, my guide was, you know, Mr. Neil, we must hide, we must hide, we are being stalked by a leopard. Um, that was um, very, very thrilling. Were you, on, were you on feet? Yeah, yeah, I actually went out in the bush, yeah, yeah. He had a gun. Um, um, <laughs> but still, you know, leopards yeah. are, you know, they'll come for you from behind and things, you know, they're very sneaky things, leopards, beautiful things, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of his experience. Um, Perfect. Like, I'm, Neil, I'm really sorry, but we, we are running out of time. Um, but thank God um, you're not going anywhere because you will be here for the next three days. Definitely, um, yeah. yeah. You are interviewing Richard Gwynn, who's with us tomorrow. Yes. And then, um, and then you're hosting a couple of panel discussions as well. So And I'm interviewing Zoe, Zoe as well. Oh, and of course, you're interviewing Zoe as well. Um, fantastic. So we, we look forward to that and we look forward to learning lots more about you and lots more about how you and Fran have um, come to this seminar um, and decided on what, what you want to talk about. Um, fascinating subject for, for us all, even those of us in Wales who sort of are already feel like we're quite familiar with the idea of Welsh literature. Um, but it's just really exciting to, to have your take on it and to see the writers that you've chosen um, and to bring them together all in one event. Um, now, um, Neil's talked about a number of his books, um, and uh, this is the secondhand car salesman bit, but um, Divya will now be posting in the chat where you can buy some of those books. Um, uh, I, as I said earlier, we're, we're trying to encourage, um, given the state of the world, um, we are trying to encourage people to shop locally. Um, and therefore we, we have uh, links to the publishers and to local bookshops where you can buy the books um, rather than that big chain beginning with A, um, which I won't mention. <laughs> A huge thank you to Neil um, and to my British Council colleagues. Um, and again, to our partners, um, the Literature Tour House and Literature Wales, coming up directly after this session. Um, we've got another film, um, again, featuring the Welsh poet, Alex Wharton, but this time with a dancer, Crystal Lowe, um, and it's the first film um, in the Plethy Reeves session that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we're going to see that film. It's only a couple of minutes long. Um, and then we're going to have a 12 minute break, 12 minutes exactly. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's your chance to have a cup of tea um, and uh, to have a walk around. Um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to be joined by our seminar co-chair, Francesca Ruddock, who is being... Um, hosted this evening by Elena Schmidt, who was moderating this evening's chat. Um, Elena is the head of programmes at Literature Wales, um, and they're going to be talking to each other. Um, Fran's going to be reading um, from her work, including, um, like Neil did, a, a new piece that hasn't been published yet. Um, so huge thank you once again um, to Neil. Thank you for all the brilliant questions. Please do keep them coming in. It, it can feel quite lonely. Obviously, we would much, much rather all be together in Stuttgart doing this, um, but we will make the best of it we can doing it online. And uh, your questions really do make it feel less lonely up here. So thank you. Questions, comments, whatever you like, keep them coming. We want them all. So thank you very, very much. Listen to the sound of frost twinkling, to leaves unraveling in the spin of morning light. I'll sit here all day, out of sight, quiet as rabbit, loose as willow. 
What else will I be but a memory of my footsteps? I am alive every breath, and I am free like the chit-chat of birds and quick clap of beating wings. In this field, this soon-to-be street, with a tip-tap of woodpecker, will become that of door knocker. And street lights will blaze in twilight's quiet face, but they will never soothe, never inspire. We are humans being, humankind. What will they find when we leave? What do we leave as we find? If we believe in the soul of sea, the heart of hill and lungs of tree, our creations will be of mass protection. This life is a celebration and the moon will dance in the song of sun. Good things to come, good things to come.
Nasbaisdaar, everybody. Good evening and herzlich willkommen. Good evening and welcome back to everyone joining us tonight for the second event of the British Council Literature Seminar, We Are Wales, Disparate Voices, Landscapes and Stories. My name is Elena Schmitz and I'm Head of Programmes at Literature Wales and I will be your host for this event. Um, as we heard earlier this evening, this seminar is delivered by the British Council in partnership with Welsh Government, Literaturhaus Stuttgart, Literature Wales and the cities of Cardiff and Stuttgart as part of the Welsh Government's um, Wales in Germany 2021 campaign. Now it was wonderful to hear from seminar co-chair Nye Griffiths earlier this evening and we also watched two films um, featuring the amazing poet Alex Wharton earlier. What a fantastic start to the seminar and I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Now our session this evening will comprise of half, a, half an hour of reading followed by a half hour question and answer session. If you joined us earlier this evening, you will already know that you can either ask a question by typing them directly into the chat um, and a moderator will read them out for you, or you can use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question directly. In that case, a moderator will come to you at the appropriate time. Um, it would be great if you could state where you are joining us from um, when you ask a question either in the chat or when you ask a question directly. But now, without further ado, um, it is my absolute delight and pleasure to introduce you to the award-winning and brilliant author, Dr. Francesca Rither, who is the seminar co-chair, alongside with Nia Griffiths, who we heard from earlier this evening. Now, Francesca is a novelist and a short story writer. Her debut novel, The Rice Paper Diaries, was long listed for the Authors Club Best First Novel Award, and also won the Wales Book of the Year Fiction Prize in 2014. She has been shortlisted for the BBC National Short Story Award for her short fiction, The Taxidermist's Daughter, which was also broadcast on BBC Radio 4. Re recently published stories include The Opposite of Drowning, Then We Both Fell and Run Away, and we hear from some of those in a minute. Francesca also has a strong editorial and critical interest in Welsh writing in both Welsh and English. She was associate editor of Planet magazine from 98 to 99, commissioning editor for Gomer Books from 2000 to 2002, and editor of literary magazine New Welsh Review from 2002 to 2008. She has edited, co-edited, and contributed to publications, including New Welsh Short Stories, which was published by Seren, um, and she co-edited that with Penny Thomas in 2015, and Debt's Love by Leonora Brito, which was published by Parthian in 2017. And she has written for the Times Literary Supplement, Francesca has been Associate Professor in Creative Writing at Swansea University since 2015 and is currently a Director of Swansea's prestigious MA in Creative Writing. So, welcome Francesca, it is a pleasure that you're here tonight with us. Thank you and thank you very much for such a lovely warm welcome Elena, I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's wonderful that the British Council and Literature Wales and all the associated partners with the support of the Welsh Assembly Government have managed to get us here together in this way. And um, I'm really pleased to have been asked to co-chair the seminar and to be have been working with Niall on choices of authors and talking about Welsh literature and what's going on in the literary scene at the moment. And so it's really wonderful to be a part of this. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to doing a reading in a moment. Great, thank you. Um, so yes, I think tonight we will hear three extracts from three short stories. Um, and I think just at the very beginning, we're off to a, a really special treat because you'll read us a little bit of a brand new unpublished story, which is called Muzzle. So um, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about this story and um, what, what, where it's set um, before you go and do a little reading of it? Okay. Um... It's it's funny, really, because sometimes, you know, people will ask uh, exactly that question, you know, how is a story inspired? Where did it come from? Um, and quite often, by the time I finish a story, I can't quite remember exactly how the journey on it began, really. Um, but I do remember with this story, Muzzle, um, that it's in, inspired by the area where I live in Cardiff now. Um, it's very close to um, Greenfields, Pont Canna Fields, Llanda Fields and Butte Park. And there are these enormous historic trees uh, that grow everywhere that sort of uh, stand right over the middle of the city. And it, it's um, quite an eerie place at night you know, and it's very close to where I live. So quite kind of dark and eerie and, and full of 
Im, you know, imagined figures, I suppose, um, but it's also a very well speaking area of the city. And um, I think that I started thinking about this story when I was out on the fields watching people taking their dogs for a walk. And I was just struck by how many of the dogs were called by their owners. Um, and the dogs all had very Welsh names like Caradog, Arthur, Poish, you know, names from the medieval Welsh tales, the Mabinogi. And there was just something about that that just struck my imagination. And I think um, that's, that then developed into this story, Muzzle, um, which is on the face of it, a tale about a boy who's lost his dog. Um, but it's also about more than that. Um, and it's all played out against a backdrop of the healing power of stories. So it does come back to the Mabinogi um, at the end. And um, the strange thing that happened in the writing of the story was that the human characters in the story, and I don't know quite how this happened, but they ended up becoming a little bit dog-like and the dog in the story becomes a little bit human. And, and I wondered after I'd written it whether this was a reflection on um, the breakdown of identity uh, that has been one of the side effects of COVID, perhaps, you know, as we experience the worldwide pandemic, who are we? I think that's a question that some of us have been asking ourselves. Um, so I'm just going to read a few pages from the beginning of the story, um, and I'll leave you to, to read the end. The story is going to be published tomorrow in Wales Arts Review, and so I don't want to give any spoilers, but I would like to give you a little taste of it. So as I say, I'll just read a little bit from the beginning. Casper. Roddy still thinks Casper's going to come home. At first, it was what he believed because it was what everyone told him. Then, after a miserable few weeks, it was what he tried to find out for himself by typing every search term he could think of into his phone. Lost dog, lost dogs near me, dogs home, dog finds way home 50 miles, dog finds way home 100 miles, dog finds way home cross country. Underneath the pictures on Pets Reunited are occasional miraculous stories about dogs who managed to get back to where they started from, which makes Roddy think it's possible Casper might do the same. Every night before supper, he insists on going out with his father and Martha onto Tlanda Fields, even when it's cold and dark and Martha says she doesn't fancy it. They go down to the weir, then back past the riding school and the allotments and through the wildflower meadow that has so recently wilted back to a few frosty mounds, calling as they go, Casper, against the subdued sound of traffic and the rise and fall of police sirens. It's obvious to Roddy that Martha's sick of Casper, or rather she's fed up of the memory of him that still bounds around the house, unruly and messy, taking over Roddy's conversations with Gwyn at the breakfast table. Do you remember, Dad, how he used to roll a ball along the grass with his nose and then flip it up in the air, do you? And how he used to like running down to the river to the stone beach where the, sto the swans come floating upstream and he liked to bark at them, not to be mean, but just because he was excited. In the mornings, Martha trips over the bowl of water which Roddy still puts out for Casper in the kitchen and he can tell she's annoyed from the way she walks around in her bare feet leaving wet marks saying, perhaps it's time to put it away now. It's not helping. And there are the germs to consider, all those bacteria. But Roddy just ignores her and fills up a fresh bowl before opening the back door and calling into the empty garden, Casper. Now, as they pass through a copse of trees, Scott's pine that seem to bend right over them, Roddy looks over at his father. Shout it out, Dad, he says. Gwyn pulls his woolen hat down over his eyebrows. Between that and his plain navy mask, all Roddy can see are his eyes, and it makes him look like somebody else, not himself. Casper, he says, that's not shouting, Dad. Roddy's trying not to sound whiny and young, but he can't help it. Casp, Gwyn says again. Twilight is falling all around them, draping the autumn colours in darkness. He won't be able to hear you, says Roddy. I thought you said dogs have special hearing. Martha looks around her as if to say, look, we're buying into this wild goose chase for your sake. Just give your father a break, why don't you? Martha doesn't understand, Roddy thinks. There's something empty about the way she throws Casper's name away so freely, pushing her hand into Gwyn's as if that's where it belongs. What is it, she says, catching him looking at her. Roddy can't say what it is exactly. Maybe it's the way she's moving, deliberately slowly, glancing in every direction before they walk on. And then there are the questions which he's beginning to think are purposely invented to make it sound as if she's never even laid eyes on Casper before. 
Oh, she's laid eyes on him, all right, his mother says when he quizzes her about it. Like Roddy, Lauren has a very particular knowledge of Casper, his likes and dislikes, the way he might take against a person just on instinct, and the possibility of that instinct being so strong it might make him panic and run off. Is he a basset, Martha says now? Does he walk low to the ground? Or is he more like a bloodhound or a whippet or a retriever? She's seemingly determined to summon him up in the shape of everything he isn't, rather than what Roddy knows his Casper to be. An albino boxer with long legs inherited from some other kind of dog, a great Afghan or a Dane perhaps. His ears tipped with red russet fur that feels silky to the touch. His face so eager to please that he looks almost human sometimes, gazing up adoringly at Roddy, waiting for his next command. Sit, heel, down boy. You know what they say about dogs, Martha says. She's turned around and is walking backwards for a few paces as if she's trying to act younger than she is. The blonde spikes of hair on top of her head making her look slightly ferocious. They've got no concept of the future and that's why they get upset when they're left on their own, even for a few hours. Every time their owner leaves, the poor dog thinks he's never coming back. Imagine that. Roddy thinks about Casper, how wild with delight he used to get when he heard the sound of the key in the door, how he would wag not only his tail, but the whole back of his body, swinging back and forth, jumping up onto his hind legs, balancing against Roddy's knees and his eyes sting with tears. Casper was always just there, waiting for him, as if the whole world revolved around him. Well, guess how old you are in dog years, he counters. He knows how much Martha hates this game, that it's fun for an 11-year-old boy, but no fun at all for her. He watches her frown, trying to work it out, that if she were a dog, she'd actually be 280, he says triumphantly. Oh, that's a good one, she says, and the corners of her mask lift up a little, as if she might be trying to smile. As they come to the children's play park, which is empty, apart from signs telling the children they mustn't play there, that they might get infected by the monkey bars or the swings or the roundabout, Roddy whistles, a proper dog whistle that makes other dogs come running. Gwyn and Martha push their way through them. Martha's disgusted, Roddy can tell, by the warmth of their lanky bodies and the saliva that drools from between their teeth. The wet tennis balls that they bring to Gwyn as if he's their master, and the way they try to nuzzle into Martha's coat pockets looking for treats before distant voices call for them, and reluctantly, one by one, they head off. Martha shivers. Everything okay? Gwyn says to her. In a voice that Roddy hates, alert as he is to the insincerity in the grown-up conversations that surround him, especially since his mother moved out and Martha had started coming round, and then staying overnight on the spare bed in the study at first, and then in the master bedroom with Gwyn, where his parents used to sleep together in a warm nest of sheets and duvet that Roddy didn't climb into in the mornings anymore, and hadn't done since he was little, but still liked to know was there. Even the memory of it is spoiled now by Martha's cropped blonde hair on the pillow, and her plucked eyebrows that lie in smooth curves across her forehead. When his mother FaceTimes him, he tries to find ways to talk to her about it, but she always changes the subject. She won't ever mention Martha by name. Tell me about school, she says, staring into the screen over his shoulder, as if she's trying to work out where he is in the house to make sense of the things on the kitchen table behind him. Martha's work stuff, a pile of papers and her appointments diary. She tries to explain that it isn't how he secretly hoped secondary school would be, exciting and noisy with hundreds of kids massing in the canteen at lunchtime, their faces close to his their voices in his ear, or collecting in overheated, intense packs around the edge of the football pitch and writing their names in the condensation on the back window of the school bus. He finds himself stuck for words, as if no one has ever experienced this before, what he's going through, not even the other kids who have to sit so far away from him and each other in the classroom. There's a one-way system, he says. They've painted yellow arrows all along the corridors so you can only walk in one direction. What if you want to go back the way you came, his mother says. You can't. He wants to touch her, to feel her presence in the same room as him. If he puts his face close to the screen, he can see the pale blue paper mask moving lightly each time she turns her head, and the shape of the wire following her nose where she's pinched it so it'll fit over the bridge. When he asks her why she wears it all the time, even in the flat, she talks about the people who bring her groceries to the door and how she's used to it now anyway. Sometimes they run out of things to say, 
but it doesn't matter because his mother likes to just watch as he walks around the house with a phone, making a film of what, what it looks like now with Martha's things in it, her ankle boots lined up by the front door and her laptop put away neatly in its soft case. When can I come and see you, he asks. Soon, she says. Then they are both quiet for a while until she starts asking about Halloween and he realises that no one has told her that he's not allowed to go knocking on people's doors this year. No one is. Tell Dad to get you a pumpkin, she says, and some fun-sized sweets. Remember to put them in a bowl by the door. And you can wear your costume that I got you last year. Remember the werewolf outfit with the lumberjack shirt? He remembers. He remembers how she'd pulled the rubber mask over his head and held her hands up in mock horror, pretending to be frightened. He remembers the way they used to walk so close to each other that he could breathe in her perfume, feel the heat of her and smell the sugary smell of sweets and toffee apples and people's fires being lit for the first time that year. <clears throat> and dry, crunchy leaves, the colour of bruised gold, gathering in little piles on the pavement and the kids running around Canton dressed as skeletons with luminous bones and vampires cloaked in outfits made out of bit black bin liners and killer clowns with painted on lips afraid but not afraid and screaming when they felt like it. I grew out of it, he says. When? He looks away from the screen. He so much wants to see her face, but not when she's looking at him like this. Ages ago, he says. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. That, that was a wonderful reading. Thank you so much. And I love this story and it, it really resonates with me personally because I live in the same area of Cardiff and uh, I know all the reference reference points and of course it's a very kind of now story in some ways but also not in others as she said um now we, we'll have a chance to go into some of the kind of themes and um, maybe you know also get some questions from the audience in the q a session but um i think before we do that um you're going to read some other stories so i think the next one you will read from um is a question called runaway which was first published in planet in 2019 and you told me that um, the story Runaway is based on a true story about a merchant seaman who brought one of his employees home to Newquay with him in the 1950s. Um, and this was an employee from Nigeria. So the man in question simply, simply seems to have disappeared one day. And you've written this story from the perspective of a local woman who is also trying to summon up the courage to run away. So we kind of get two new characters in the story. So would you like to um, give us a little taste of this story and yes. anything else you'd like to tell us about it? That would be great. Um, yeah, I was I was interested in, in well, among among the many things I was interested in that Niall was talking about earlier, I was fascinated to hear him say that he's now working on historical fiction, um, because I suppose I'm coming from the other direction where I've been always very immersed in historical fiction, and now I'm writing more contemporary work. And um, I think what has really struck me is actually historical fiction is is just a label, isn't it? That that people put on your work and actually in all kinds of work set in different periods, you get the past bleeding into the present all the time. Um, and you get the, the present, you know, has the past stacked up behind it. It's always there. Um, so in that sense, you know, all fiction is historical fiction. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, this story is, is a historical piece. It's called Runaway. And it's set um, in a fictional version of the West Wales that I come from in a roadside garage. And as you said, it's based on a true story about a man from Nigeria who was brought to the area in the early 1950s by a local merchant seaman. <clears throat> now this is the area that I come from and it has a very um, sort of rich maritime heritage. Um, and I'm proud of that, you know, there's so much about it that's fascinating and interesting and I've written about some of it previously in the Rice Paper Diaries, but I am also aware that um, I'm aware of some of its less comfortable, uh, should we say, colonialist aspects. And um, as a writer, I think it's sort of important to explore those less comfortable sides of yourself or where you're from or who you think yourself to be um, and, uh, and this episode is definitely one of, of those um, and I certainly as a writer I didn't feel that I had the right to ventriloquize this man's story um, to make assumptions about the, him and to project them onto somebody whose world I've never known um, and yet the only person who had ever told me about him was my mother and and the story just seems to have been forgotten or to have disappeared you know apart from that 
And so I, it felt important to me to record that he was brought here and why, and the fact that he ran away. So literally just the bare bones of his story um, and to reflect on those circumstances. And so what I did was to bring him into a story that I was writing about somebody else, um, another character who is also running away, um, but for different reasons. She's a 1950s housewife and she's trying to escape domesticity and disillusionment. Um, and so the few facts that I wrote about Saibu, the man from Nigeria, are all filtered through the consciousness of this woman um, from the local area. And so what I've tried to do with the story is to make a space in it for somebody who's better placed than I am in every sense of the word. You know, I'm thinking about future versions of this story that might be written by somebody else. Um, so all I've tried to do really is to record this, this brief chapter in this man's life. And again, I'm just going to read a few pages from the beginning of the story to give you a taste of it. The yellow lining was always a surprise. Sometimes it was the gaudiness that made her stop short. At others, the thought perhaps that she didn't have the right clothes or enough money, or maybe she just wasn't ready yet. This time, the case opened up like a ripe peach that had been sliced into two golden halves, offering up a tortoise shell brush set strapped into the lid and gathered pockets made of soiree taffeta. It was four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon in November, and she was planning on being gone by five. She hadn't decided yet which of the cars on the garage forecourt she would take. They were all for sale, but as they all belonged to Daniel, it wouldn't really matter which one she chose, perhaps the saloon in Forest Green or the white Jaguar, the 52 Daniel called it, as if it was a classic already, whose long wide panels and close set headlamps made it look like a bug-eyed cartoon character. She would put her case in the boot and drive off the forecourt straight over the junction and away. Everything would go smoothly, she was sure it would. She had been through the same scene in her mind's eye many times before. The window above the bed was almost as wide as the spare room where Elspeth packed her bags while her husband, who was a lay preacher on the days the garage was closed for business, was out at Mariah or Zion or Peniel, promising his congregations the gift of eternal life. The thought of a life with him that might last forever was what had goaded her into it at first, but by now it had become a habit, something she did to pass the time when she was alone. The spare bedroom overlooked the back of the house and the three blue petrol pumps that stood so straight on the forecourt, their dials pointing to whatever the last sale would have been the day before, a couple of gallons of diesel probably. Barely a car had gone past since then, crossing the coast road to the huge high stretch of land on the other side. Elspeth hadn't realised when she'd got married how bleak it would be up here. She thought she and Daniel could make it homely, fill the house with children and the garage with customers all year round. She'd had plans that she thought Daniel would share. She'd put bunches of wildflowers out for sale next to the pumps and turned the shop into a little cafe in the style of a diner, like one she'd seen in a magazine, with black and white tiles on the floor and piped leather seats. For the kids, she'd put sweets in big jars and lined them up right behind the counter so the mums and dads would see them when they paid and be encouraged to spend a few more pence on raspberry drumsticks. Daniel had gone along with it all at first, but as soon as he could find an excuse to pull her dreams apart, he had. There was no drama. It had happened slowly, piece by piece. First, he sold the jukebox to one of the summer visitors when they offered him a price he couldn't refuse. Soon after that, he changed the tablecloth. And then one day he even pulled up the lino, saying it was difficult to clean, so the floor was back to bare, cold cement again. After a few years, the only thing that reminded her what had been there before was the row of glass jars filled with sweets and yellows and pinks glistening as the sun caught them, and the sprinkles of sugar they left on the counter. She reached across the bed to close the curtains. She could drive in the dark just as well as in the light, she thought. She could take one of the back lanes cut across the swathes of farmland. She was about to pull the curtains along the rail when she saw a movement in the creeping shadows of the bottom field. A man stepping out of the grey mist that had already smothered the line of the sea on the horizon. She knew she should be afraid, that she should phone one of the neighbours just as Daniel had told her she should if he ever came here again, but she didn't. Until he was called at the garage the other week, she hadn't seen him for herself, so now, curious, she stood at the window and looked. He was wearing a decent suit and a long coat. 
both of which must have belonged to someone else first, someone much shorter than him. He lifted his long legs high as he walked in order to avoid the cow pass, so that as he made his way through the grassy tussocks sprouting like big stones out of the damp earth, he looked as if he was crossing a shallow river, trying to stay dry. She wondered why he was coming through the woods rather than walking along the road. Perhaps he didn't want anyone to see him. The mist was softening the edge of the fields, and it wasn't until he climbed over the stile which led onto the forecourt that Elspeth saw he was carrying a leather hold -all. This wasn't such a surprise. Living up here, she saw them coming and going all the time, bags, suitcases, valises and trunks being packed into cars ready to be carried over the hills and moors and away to Liverpool or Cardiff, cities with docks and ships that went around the world carrying and fetching things, sugar, hardwood, coal dust or sliced rich fruits tinned in syrup. When the men came home again long months later, those same suitcases would be filled with presents, cigarettes from Malta laid out like chocolates in a box, or Japanese tea sets or wooden antelopes carved in teak with pointed horns. And then one day, as well as the cases and trunks weighing down the cars going past the garage, there'd been something else or rather someone else brought back from Nigeria was what Daniel told us when she came home, because Daniel had been the one to see him and to hear all the talk around the petrol pumps, sitting in the passenger seat of one of the cars, looking around him with the air of a person who has lost and doesn't expect ever to be found again. This man, Saibu. Thank you, Fran. I just love you listening, listening to you read that story. It's, it's a beautiful story and it's so rich and there's so much depth to it, I think. And um, you know, hopefully everybody who reads that story will get that sense also. And, and also your care, I think, that you place on these characters and how you write about them. And you've just said that in the introduction, um, so again, we can come back to that in, in the um, Q&A session. I'm conscious we have a little bit um, less time maybe than we thought we would at this stage, um, because I'm, I really would also like to hear um, a short extract from the um, taxidermist's daughter, which um, of course some of the people in the audience might be familiar with, and because it has to be made um, into a BBC4 radio version, so somebody you know might have listened to it already, but it would be great if you could give us a short reading of that as well, and then we'd go back to the chat, so I don't want to say too much more at this stage. Of course, no, that's fine. So, um, so yeah, so my last extract is from the story, The Taxidermist's Daughter, and um, I suppose it's only when you put stories together like this to, to read them for an audience that you, you think about maybe the similarities between them, and I think it's another story about the power dynamics of relationships. Um, which I'm always really interested in, and um, the impact of big sort of worldwide events on the small precious lives of individuals. I think that was something else that Niall touched on in, in his talk, and I think, you know, that's certainly something that in my own way really energises my writing and what I want to write about. So, um, so yeah, so in this story, which takes place shortly after the First World War, my young protagonist Daisy, who's around 14 years old, is helping her father in his taxidermy shop. Um, the story is set on a county town on the coast where there's plenty of hunting and shooting and fishing going on to supply the shop with uh, things to do. And Daisy is fascinated by her father's business and she wants to help out as much as she can. But um, her father won't let her ever do any more than just paint the backs of the, the display cases, which she does willingly. Um, but distracted by her grief for her older brother David, who um, fell at the Somme. But she does, however, perk up a little bit with the arrival of a visitor, a professor of natural history, who takes up lodgings with her parents and becomes friendly with her father, Ted. Um, and they say, don't they, that, you know, all essential, essentially all stories are about sex and, and death. Um, and I think if that's not true, then this one is certainly no exception. Um, and the extract that I'm going to read to you is just a brief extract. It starts a little way into the story when the professor has turned up and he's asking about renting a room. Outside the shop, it was just as her mother had said, people queuing up wanting to sell dead animals to her father. One man had a pole cat as long as a python between his fingers, another a bittern that he held by the beak. He looked pleased with himself, despite the stench coming off the bird that surely meant it was far off being fresh. Most of them, though, had come straight from the beach where the petrels had been carried up on the tide after the storm, their tube noses frozen tight shut and their rigid white feathers flaked with patches of black 
like snow in reverse. The men knew they wouldn't get more than a few shillings for them, but Ted was known for taking any small bird for a price. He always had a use for them, even if it was just in the background of a large case. You've got to set the scene, he'd say to Daisy, as she tried to hold her hands steady, painting a blue sky intended for the back of a display. You can't just give people a stuffed creature and expect them to be done with it. They need action, something about to happen. How can something be about to happen, Daisy said, concentrating on a cloudburst of yellow. They're dead, aren't they? That doesn't matter. People need drama, dead or not, to make them want to look at the case again and again. What's the point of paying four pounds for a swan in a box if you're barely going to look at it? And so in Ted's boxes, rabbits lolloped away from foxes who crouched over ledges, waiting to ambush or already pouncing on partridges with their preserved guts ripped open for all eternity. Butterflies, beetles and moths were everywhere, their fragile wings wide, terribly beautiful. At the head of the queue outside the shop was Ted's stuffed bear standing up on its hind legs. It was his favourite creature, he said, because it was both exotic and attractive. Often small children would linger to stroke his fur as they went by, smiling at the silver tray set between his paws to make him look like a dumb waiter. Daisy always thought of him as a him. His lordship, David used to call him, wheeling him out on the, onto the pavement each morning. The professor, though, projected no such airs and graces onto his lordship. In fact, he barely gave him a second look as if he was nothing more than a freakish creation set there to attract the attention of those who didn't know better. Her father was standing in the middle of his workshop in his cloth cap and long white starched apron with half-skinned animals lying all about him. There was a vixen on the table, pawing at his overall, her head to one side and her tongue hanging out. Tongues were her father's speciality, each displaying a deep grooved line cut down the middle with his smallest knife. She would be dry by now. All Ted had to do was push a pair of glass eyes into her preserved sockets, and Ted was particular. There were no teddy bear eyes for him. He would rather just plain black. Then she would be ready for the case that Daisy had painted the day before. Sometimes when she slept, she saw her father's stuffed creatures in her mind's eye, but in her dreams they moved, they panted, they whispered in her ear, strange things that made no sense to her about there being no heaven and earth, no life ever after, their forked tongues stroking her earlobe, making her body prickle all over, waking her up. She didn't tell her father about her dreams, nor even her mother. Alice, she knew, would have said that she had no time to dream. She was harnessed to the here and now. Father, Daisy said, there's a gentleman to see you about the lodgings. She still didn't think of it as lodgings, the room at the top of the house. She thought of it as David's room. She saw the professor looking up at an albino stoat hanging from a wire, its colourless ermine slowly hardening as it dried. Incredible, he said. He put his hand into his pocket and brought out a red and white checkered handkerchief. He blew his nose and kept the kerchief to it. He mustn't mind the smile, sir, said Ted. Daisy remembered that she hadn't liked it either when she started working alongside her father after David had left. She had been disgusted by the bits of decomposing flesh on the floor, which had to be swept up at the end of each day, and the commercial carpenter's glue her father favoured, with its stink of boiled hooves and bones. Ted had said she'd get used to it, and he was right. She watched the gentleman with some amusement. How long do they last, he said. Forever, sir, Ted said. Daisy here tapes up the boxes, you see. Once they're taped up, those boxes, sir, nothing can get at them. No air, no insects, nothing. They will live in those boxes forever. They'll never change. You could knock on this door in a hundred years and they'd still be here, just as they were the day we put them in their boxes, isn't it, Daisy? Yes, father. The gentleman looked at her and at the paintbrush she picked up from one of the tables, ready to get back to work. Why do you make the sky so blue, young miss? It doesn't really look like that, does it? Daisy wasn't sure if he was joking. He didn't smile, but he was staring at her as if he wouldn't leave off until she said something. So she gave him an answer as straight as she could. I'll paint it what colour I like, sir. It's my sky, isn't it? Thank you. Right, thank you, Fran. And I, I, I that's sorry, it's just so beautiful and it's so, it's so visual. And I think that's something in, in all of your work for me, it kind of really evokes like the, the sense of place and the sense I can really, visualize it almost to the point that I can see it as a kind of I feel like I've watched this on TV you know you feel like it's, it's already been made and I've, it absolutely should be made into a series. Text is not a particularly I think would be a brilliant adaptation for TV 
Um, but thank you so much. Um, again, I'm conscious that we're slightly running a little bit late and we're eating into the Q&A session. I just want to start off with um, some questions myself, which you've already touched on before opening it out to the audience. But I was quite struck by this, um, and we heard that from, from Neil earlier as well, you know, that in a sense, as you mentioned, it's almost the opposite for you, that you come from writing historical fiction. And it, it's, I found it really fascinating that your, your most recent work, which you've read from earlier, Muzzle, is, is very much set in the present. It's almost, you know, it's almost still kind of alive with, you know, with, with realness of like the current situation that we live in. But I think also, you know, all of your other work is, is very much about, you know, the personal stories. So you're kind of finding these very individual personalized stories and they're making them, you know, say in Rice Paper Diaries, it's obviously, you know, set in Hong Kong and it, it's, it's about historical things, but it's also very much about the people and you really live with them, you feel with them. And I just wondered how you feel about, you know, that possibly that change for you and that switch? Or is that the trajectory you see yourself going in as a writer? Or is that just completely coincidental that you hadn't even thought of? Um, I don't think I'm um, deliberately heading in any direction. <laughs> um, and I think I'm just becoming more aware. I'm also writing a novel at the moment which moves between the past and the present. And I'm just really aware that maybe you reach a certain Point when you're writing about um, something that you know really matters to you, where you don't really think too much about is this the past, is this the present, is this what the character remembers, is it what other people are talking about, you know, subsequently. And so there's a certain kind of fluidity to the way I'm, I'm writing about the past and present at the moment, over which I don't feel I have a great deal of control, um, but it seems to work. Um, so I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily going in a particular direction. I think it really depends upon what the material needs. I know that when I started writing um, Muzzle, that I didn't have any plans for it to be a COVID story. I definitely didn't want to write a COVID story, and I don't really think it is in many ways. Um, but it's quite hard, isn't it, when you start to write a story and you see the characters and all your characters are wearing masks. It's quite hard then to write a story, I think, where you're not seeing those things. So um, particularly when you're a relatively realist uh, writer. So um, so I think I just, you know, write as it comes really. I don't necessarily have a, a direction, but I certainly love that move between past and present. You know, that's one of the dynamic aspects of writing that I really, really enjoy. And I and I think you know you're doing that really brilliantly to kind of you know write about characters that are rooted in in their time or off their time, but they're also timeless at, at the same time. You know, and I think even with with Muzzle, which is very contemporary and very new, but but as you said, there's so many other elements to it that that are not just. I mean, I thought the whole thing with COVID and that it is of now, but it's very subtly dealt with. It's almost like you can almost miss it unless you really kind of oh oh it is it is now and that, and it, you know it could just as well be said you know a long time ago. So I. And I think that's that's quite a skill, and I think that's that's brilliant how you do that as a writer. And um, I would like to um, bring the audience in now. I think there have been some already. Um, I know somebody's got their hand up. So Rebecca, have we got some questions, please? We do indeed. Um, so let's get started with Lewis Davis in Sin Dog Wars, and he asks: There's a strong sense of place and time dislocated in your work. People leave, are imprisoned, return. The history of a place seems to speak to you. How important is that for you as a writer, Fran? You make it sound really cheery, Lewis. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that you've put your finger on it actually, that it's the history of a place that definitely stimulates my imagination. And I'm sure you know there are there are writers in the audience who will say something similar that um I suppose I just think of all the the layers and layers, you know, you think of wallpaper, layers and layers of wallpaper, one under the other, and, and it's a little bit like peeling some of it back and getting a glimpse into the lives of people, you know, who went before. And um, that's something that, yeah, absolutely stimulates my imagination. And um, often I think, I found this a great deal with the Rice Paper Diaries, my first novel. I think that it's the gaps, isn't it, that you can't fill um, when you, on your fact-finding missions into the past, um, that they can be the most fascinating and, and the ones that you want to return to. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, I mean, 
Yeah, I think that, yeah, that, I mean, again, you know, I think that sense of place to me is, is it's so evocative, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm an incomer to Wales, I've lived here a very, very long time, but um, I'm, I'm originally from Germany, and I, I really can see the places that you write about in my, in my mind, and almost to the point that I feel like I've already watched them, and I think that's just, that's just brilliant, um, and again, great, great testament to your skills as a writer to kind of conjure up that sense of place in, in your work. Um, Rebecca, I think there were some we, other questions. Who, um, yeah, somebody who's raised their hands. I'm quite excited. So should we go to them? Um, Melissa, um, you've got your hands up and uh, my colleague is going to unmute you. So ask away. Tell us where you are, if you, if you can. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Melissa from, from University of Germany, uh, University of Erlangen in Germany, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you very much, Francesca. That was so interesting, and I'm really thrilled to read your short stories, and uh, especially I'm excited for Muscle. Um, yeah, Elena already talked about uh, your strong visuality, and I think Lewis also um, asked about plays, and uh, you said yourself that you consider yourself a realist writer. And now I was wondering um, whether you find it easier when you actually imitate people or places or really go and, and maybe write at those places or whether you prefer to use more of your imagination and and also to kind of you know have a reason to to use poetic liberty and just um yeah have more freedom not um yeah basically be judged by people for wrongly describing things or i, I don't know well thank you melissa that's a that's a you know really good comprehensive question I've tried to, to answer it I think um yeah I'm, I'm I suppose I'm not sure that I define myself as realist but I could I can see that a lot of my work is fairly realist um but I think I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Alice Munro the short story writer um but I do really enjoy the way that she is pretty realist in some ways, but moves her story sometimes quite often at the end into a slightly less realist territory. And I really enjoy seeing how other writers do that, you know, how they move between something that feels broadly realist, but then it has something a little bit strange or eerie or different um, to, to sort of lift the reader out of the, of the everyday. But coming back to your question about, you know, when you are writing in the realist mode, and I think, um, I suppose with the Rice Paper Diaries, because it was a um, a novel set in a particular place that I needed to go and get to know and find out about. I definitely felt a responsibility with that novel to get the details right, um, partly because I was writing a story that was based on a, on a true story and um, I wanted to keep it quite close to what I thought might have happened. So, so yeah, I think I do feel a responsibility, but I don't feel that everything that I write necessarily needs to be in exactly that mode. But, but I think there is a certain responsibility when you're writing something that's very obviously close to how an original story unfolded. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. Thank you. And we've got I another one, if that's all right, Elena. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just just very briefly back. I'm sorry, just thank you for that. But also to say, um, Francesca, obviously with Rice Paper Diaries is also a very personal story in the sense that it, it's inspired or, you know, came from kind of you trying to figure out what had happened to your grandmother. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So it probably even more of a reason maybe to to try to be accurate or try to find facts that might be rooted in accuracy, at least um, when you kind of obviously it's a work of fiction, but, you know, when you kind of try to reconstruct what may have occurred. Yeah, yeah, I think reconstruct is a really good verb to use there. That, um, that I did feel a sense of responsibility, but you know, it was interesting how I had to use my imagination to fill in the gaps, and that was the point at which the book actually had lift off. So I think at a certain point, you, you do have to sort of leave all your anxieties and responsibilities behind. Um, but I know that one of my elderly relatives that she asked um, her son, one of my cousins, to write down for her who was who in the book um, because she wanted to know who, because obviously I didn't use people's real names, and she wanted to know who equated to who. So he had to write out a list of so-and-so equals so-and-so. And I just thought that equals sign <laughs> is uh, you know, quite fascinating because it actually reduces all the fiction back down to, to something else. And, and you know, um, if the fiction is working, it ultimately peels away a little bit from the history, I think, in the end, just to contradict myself. 
Yeah, it's possibly a bit scary also because you might then, you know, almost in your own mind that becomes reality if it is rooted in, in real. So, you know, and from a personal, you know, family history's point of view, that could become quite confusing possibly. <laughs> but fascinating because it is so, you know, it's so realistic in a way that it could have happened exactly like that, even though it might have happened completely differently. And that's, that's yeah, just... Really yeah, and I think you know that's all I was hoping for with that novel, really. And um, I, I really do feel often that you know the novel is a map of the human heart, that that it's about feelings as much as facts and figures. And um, I think that's one of the main reasons why I write fiction. And I thought that writing fiction based on reality would be a good place to start as a writer, and that I could learn a lot from it. But it's it's actually quite challenging, <laughs> um, you know. But but I did learn a lot from from the writing of it, and um, I learned a lot about writing other kinds of fiction too. And it was it was worth all the risks and responsibilities, definitely. Great, thank you, Fran. Um, I think we have some more questions, Rebecca. Yeah, we do. Um, so we've got one from. Zoe Brigley, who's one of our featured writers, um, and we'll be hearing from her tomorrow. Her question is, everything in these stories, Fran, is so beautifully observed, and the characters are the ones that notice things. As Hardy puts it, um, I wonder, therefore, if it's quite important that these stories centre women's perceptions, women's observations of the world, the precise details of women's stories. Yeah, that's um, that's such a beautifully written question <laughs> that I'm admiring the way you've worded it. Thank you for that. Um, I think that I don't deliberately set out to record women's lives. I don't. I'm not on a sort of political mission. I don't think in that sense. But I don't know. I've just always found all the female characters, people in, in my family so interesting. It's almost like they've, they've all got, you know, my grandmothers and great grandmothers have all got these fascinating personal stories that I want to tell and, and record and put down in some shape or form. And um, I think, yeah, but the, those sort of quiet domestic lives that are deep and interesting. I just find them, you know, some people probably find them deeply boring, but I just find them really fascinating characters that have that kind of depth. Um, and I think they do have some kind of resonance for now as well. When you write about the past in this sense, you know, it, it does have something to say about now. I was just reading an article the other day um, in The Observer, Natasha Walter, I don't know if anybody else read it, but um, talking about how um, we really need to bring materialist feminism back into vogue. <clears throat> There's a lot of um, what's going on for women at the moment is, um, you know, kind of 1950s, uh, being locked back up at home while COVID is, is ongoing and having to shoulder a phenomenal amount of housework and so on. You know, it's something that hasn't gone away and won't go away until we really face it head on, I think, as women from different backgrounds, classes, colours, creeds, everything. Um, so uh, that's how I you know, feel as an individual about these things. But as a writer, I tend to just gravitate towards the stories, I think, in quite a simple way. Um, but the, yeah, I, I, I do love all the stories that there are in families as well not just secrets but just the stories that that a family you know remembers about a certain character and I love the way that families have certain dynamics um, and I suppose these are the things that you notice if you're interested really um, yeah I hope that, that that's a very meandering answer to your question but I hope I've answered the question great thank you for and, and I think also I mean I you know I get that sense as well that you know you often kind of give the voice and power to to the characters that might be the kind of quieter ones or you know whether that's women and often of course historically that that is the women who wouldn't have had that voice who wouldn't have had that historical narrative maybe put front and center but i think that comes through really strongly in, in your work that that you know you, you give the characters that might often be overlooked or they might be the ones that you you wouldn't have the historical you know records of they're mm. the ones that are kind of centered and it's their story that's being told often and that's you know that's a as you say important but also really beautifully done and yeah you can you can kind of relate to that and you know you can you can feel with them so it's very empathetic i think in that sense as well mm, and back i think we have at least one question more. in the chat yeah we've got one more from regensburg university okay I can't see who it is but um he or she asks a theme that seems to reappear in many of your work I think is that of coming home, um, or at least looking for something like home. 
Um, is there this a way of reimagining your meaning of Welshness? I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, with it, when you're writing a novel, you're trying to bring the story home as well, bring it to the right ending for that story too. Um, I know that with The Rice Paper Diaries, I felt that it became an interesting novel to write, particularly when the characters came home. And um, I realized that there didn't necessarily have to be a happy ending. Um, and in fact, in, in this instance, in the real life story, there hadn't been a happy ending. The couple who've been through so much together in, in prison, in a prisoner of war camp, come home and actually break up and um, never live together ever again. So um, I think there's something about that word unheimlich, um, you know, the, un, the uncanny and having heim in the middle of it, you know, makes, makes me think about the, the resonance of home as being not ho wholly positive. I think home is a very, very powerful concept, um, but I think it can entrap as well as it, as it holding people close. So I think there's certainly, yeah, there probably is that theme of, of coming home, um, but it, not necessarily in a, in a straightforward way either. Um, but having said that, I'm somebody who loves home. You know, I love my home area where I was born. Um, I love the thought of home. All these things are very sort of warm and close to me as a person, but in my fiction, I definitely enjoy um, exploring the darker sides, I suppose. And thank you for uh, bringing that word up, unheimlich. As, as a German speaker, it hadn't, you know, it doesn't even like normally occur to me that that actually is related to, to home and heim because it just it also means spooky. So it has that kind of dual meaning in German as well. But yeah, that's that's really fascinating. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question. Brilliant. That's good. Um, um, like, because I can see that's a one. great one. Yeah, from West Yorkshire, Catherine in West Yorkshire. Um, she says, hi, Francesca, um, I'm working on my first novel, which is also inspired by the hidden past of the women in my family. I would love to hear how you find your way in balancing the scales of truth, historical research and story. And do these ever contradict one another? Do difficult decisions come up when you are faced with that peeling away from the original story? Oh, that's such a great question. Um... I think um, when I started out working on the book, I was just thinking about writing a memoir and that made it quite you know, straightforward and easy. I just thought I'll do the research, I'll find out what happened to my great aunt because she had never really spoken about it. Um, I thought I'll find out what happened, I'll write this memoir, you know, job done, it'll be great. Um, and I felt that I had the non-fiction writing skills to do that. Um, but somehow, I think it was partly the frustration of not being able to find out exactly what happened to her. Um, my great aunt was like many people, men and women who'd, who'd been in the Far East, um, mm -hmm. in that uh, the trauma of the experience of being in prison stayed with her. And she dealt with it like many people did by just not talking about it when she came home. I mean, she was an amazing woman in so many ways, but that was just one thing that she didn't talk about. Um, and I think it, I was at a certain point where I realized I just wasn't going to be able to find out enough to write this memoir that I thought, well, possibly I could try to reimagine a life, you know, the life of somebody like her, how it might have turned out. Um, and so from that point on, I did, I did a little bit of research and then a little bit of writing and then a little bit of research and a little bit of writing. And it was a very kind of piecemeal <clears throat> sort of way. Um, and at the time, I was really lucky because I lived within sight of the National Library of Wales. It was just up on the hill from our house. And uh, I would just go there and do bits of digging around. And I found quite a lot of interesting information that was really useful. Um, and, and somehow it just seemed to grow from there. But there are difficult decisions to be made. I think if you use a lot of first person research, which I think you need to with this kind of story, then you'll end up with a pretty good um, almost like pen portraits of people. There, there were two guards in the camp where, where my great aunt was imprisoned who were described by various different sources. And you realize that actually these, these people, if you just take them and use them in your fiction, they're going to maybe be 
too good as facsimiles of the original. And so then you have to think about how to how to change what was real and to make it more fictional. So it's an interesting kind of fiction to write, I think, because it's not pure fiction. Um, it's a little bit of dramatization and reconstruction as well as as well as fiction. So but certainly in terms of going about it, I think um, it's definitely a good idea to just to keep on doing a little bit of research as you go along. Otherwise, I think you can get bogged down in the research and fascinated by the research because there's so much there um, and then not actually move on with your story. And ultimately, what's going to make it a novel is, is that a gripping story or not? You know, is, is it going to grab your reader and hold on to them? So that would be my advice, just to, to do a little of each as you go along and just watch it grow, hopefully. That's such good advice. Thank you, Fran. And I, I think also, I mean, I... There's a lot more, you know, to discuss, of course, and unfortunately, we, we're a little bit short of time now. It's um, we've got about four minutes left. Um, so I would I would love to explore that more. And also, uh, we've talked about this before in terms of, you know, short story novel and where you see the difference. But you said to me, you're a prose writer, first and foremost. And I think that's that's really interesting also in terms of advice for writers. You know, you've got to kind of find the story you want to tell before you consider the form, I guess, and, and the length and you know what, what it eventually becomes. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions now, but Fran, I just wanted to ask you um, in terms of, you know, this is of course the first evening of the seminar, so we've got another two days to look forward to, um, you know, what, what are you most looking forward to? Because of course you and Niall have um, worked together on, on selecting the writers that are going to be featured over the next two days. So are there any kind of themes or highlights that you would like to, you know, recommend or just... Yes, yes, definitely. Um... Yeah, I mean, that, that's the, the joy of the role that Niall and I are sharing is that we've had some great conversations as fellow writers about, you know, what's going on in the literary scene at the moment. Um, there are so many writers who we really, really rate. It's extremely difficult just to suggest a few. I have to say you made our job really difficult being aware of the richness of the scene and there's huge variety in terms of writing, you know. Um, I feel as if I could name everybody who's out there who's publishing at the moment and it still wouldn't be enough. Um, but yes, yeah, so the next couple of days, I can tell you what I'm going to be doing, which is uh, chairing a session with the wonderful Welsh language writer, um, Manon Stefan Ross, who's written an incredible number of novels, over 20 novels. And um, one of her latest novels is a, a real hit. So it's just, it's a wonderful book, um, which I have great admiration for. And we're going to be talking about that and another of her books called Blassie. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to that session. So that session would be a Welsh language session with uh, a simultaneous translation available. Um, and I'm also really excited about interviewing um, Charlotte Williams as well, the author of Sugar and Slate. I first met Charlotte Williams nearly 20 years ago when I was editing the New Welsh Review and I was just completely wowed by her writing. She's an amazing writer and um, I'm just so looking forward to introducing her to the conference's audience and, and um, I know that she's got a lot to say about writing and identity and um, I'm sure that people have lots of questions for her as well. Great, thank you so much Fran. Um... There's a few more things I'd like to just um, say now, but uh, thank you so much for, for the reading and also for discussing your work. I, I've, it's been a real pleasure and, and privilege to hear you speak and also so great, of course, that we can bring you to an international audience. We've had some people, I think, in the chat from Malaysia, so we've got a really truly international audience who are joining us at, you know, different times of the day or, or night, of course, for that as well. Um, but just to... Um, to, to close, so I would just like to repeat, you mentioned this earlier, so Muzzle, the unpublished short story that you've read from at the very beginning, will actually be published in, in satiety tomorrow morning, I believe, on the Wales Arts Review website. Um, I'm sure we can put that um, in the chat. And then I would also like to, um, you know, encourage everybody to buy books. Um, for Fran, of course, Fran's books, but also um, books of the other writers featured. Um, and again, we've put a lot of um, links to kind of local Welsh bookshops. Um, and of course, you, you might need to find them locally somewhere in Germany, but it would be great if you could support the writers as well and, and buy and order the books if you haven't already. Um, and then I would just like to thank you again, Fran, for, for being here tonight, for being one of the co-chairs and also to Neil, of course. And then also, you know, huge thanks to the British Council teams in Wales, in Germany, and the British Council Literature team. So Rebecca, Elka, Harriet, Divya, Hasina, and many, many other colleagues. 
Um, the partners in this um, whole event, Literatur House Stuttgart, Literature Wales, and also Welsh Government, which of course we're in the Wales Germany year that we're celebrating. And of course, to the audiences that have joined us tonight for this event and also the, um, the films and Neil's um, event earlier tonight, it's been a huge pleasure and I hope you've enjoyed the evening. We're back tomorrow with our first event at 2 p.m. Um, UK time or 3 p.m. Central European time for a panel discussion with the writers Alex Wharton, Hannah Nisa and Richard Owen Roberts, which will be chaired by Dr. Elaine Koenig. So thank you so much, everybody, um, and good night, good night, thank you.